Do you think Eminem's mom knew how to make spaghetti for, for 20 hungry men? <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta fry the garlic in the oil, you know. <laughs> you gotta fry the garlic, and then you put the meatballs in in, in the sauce. In yeah, the sauce. with a little red wine exactly. and some sugar. That's my secret, dude. I'm so glad we get this cooking advice from the Godfather. Where would we be? <laughs> this movie taught me everything I know about cooking, and the days of the week. We learned the days of the week from this movie. Monday, oh, yeah. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to Not Your Father's Movies. I'm Vito. I'm Mike. And I'm Jesse. And we are the Godfathers, coming at you with some Godfather energy. Oh, how many yeah. episodes I've just been waiting for you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, show some respect to your Godfathers. <laughs> are we going to keep on like doing impersonations throughout this podcast? I would recommend it. I mean, what, else, what else are we doing here? I don't know. I don't know what else we're doing here. I want to. I want to hear. I want to hear your your impersonation. I know I'm horrible at impersonation. That's you why I want to hear it. I wouldn't want to hear that it I'm good. really bad at it. Um, <laughs> leave the gun. Out. Take the cannoli. <laughs> yeah, see, it's bad. <laughs> it was really horrible. You could have like put some. You could have put some effort into it. All right, we'll let you off the hook. Um, but we here at Not Your Father's Movies, we just in case you're joining us for the first time here on our Father's Day episode. We will be covering, we'll tell you if we haven't given it away already, but we cover the genre of dad, dad movies. We talk dad movies. What are they? And that's pretty much what we do. Every episode, we try and cover a new movie, usually in a series that we have constructed around a central theme. And we're always trying to pick which movie from the, the distant past, the near past or the present, we'd like to call a dad movie, put up on the dad hall of fame. Um, sometimes we get criticized for just only naming things that are family movies. And sometimes we don't like obvious dad movies. But we're all trying to blaze our own way here as dads who have very young children. What do we want to show them and why? Is that a fairly good summation, guys? That's a great summation. That's it. You know? I, I would also like to add that on top of series, we also do have special episodes like this one for Father's Day, and we have a Mother's Day episode on aliens. Check that out. Mm. And we also have a monthly new release, which I don't think we've have we said widely that we're going to do that monthly? But we are. We're going to do that monthly. Yeah, yeah. we're going to do that monthly. Here it is. It's yeah, and, and that's partly, I mean, because we're trying to define, you know, what is a dad movie for us as parents with with young children? We're trying to to see, like, what are we going to pass on? And new movies come out all the time. Yeah. More and more so now that the pandemic is seems to be over. Um, I, I, for the in, most in part. In popular culture certainly seems to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah. 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 So, so with those, we have our, our seasonal holiday releases. Uh, and it's, it's kind of fun that we get the Mother's Day and Father's Day back to back. We're using this as an opportunity, just like we did with Mother's Day, to talk about a classic that we all really, really love. And it's The Godfather. We're covering The Godfather, guys. Uh, <laughs> that, that's pretty good. Yeah. See, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Mike makes horny noises. <laughs> Jesse Jesse, not, I'm just imagining like your children on the other side of your wall being like, what is that? Why is that making those strange noises? <laughs> I, I'm very uncomfortable at this moment. <laughs> okay. So we're talking about The Godfather, here, um, which is uh, the godfather of films, one might say. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Probably like uh, heralded as, as maybe the classic movie. I, yeah, I can't think of anything else that rises to this level when it comes to just like it, everybody loves it. Almost everybody loves it. I've seen a couple of like three and a half star reviews. Yeah, I don't know if that's really about. weird to me. But yeah. You, by the way, out there, you know who you are and you should be ashamed. Should be ashamed. <laughs> this is not a three and a half star movie. Have you seen a three and a half star movie? This breaks the scale. I mean, five doesn't do it justice. The reason the reason we have the the, the star or numerical rating system is because the Godfather. We we found the ceiling and we're just counting down. <laughs> that might be too much hyperbole, I guess. But I think it's fair. Is there stuff. such a thing as too much hyperbole? Mm -hmm. Good point. Good point. There we go. <laughs> but we're doing the Godfather because it's 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 
it's the dad movie. This is the dad movie. And I don't think that even if you don't like it that much, I don't know if you can argue with that. Yeah. Even speaking of hyperbole, like the Godfather itself has become a hyperbole, right? Mm -hmm. If you say this is the Godfather is something, you're talking about the best. Yeah. And here we have the best. I think prior to the Godfather coming out, I wonder if people said that. And by that, they meant, oh, this is like the Godfather of that. And people be like, oh, you mean like kind of not around and don't remember him after I was dying? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Boy, okay. So I don't, know, I don't even know if we need any more preamble. I think, I think we just need to get into uh, what we usually do on our episodes is after we introduce the show, we waste everyone's time by goofing around and talking about why we're covering this movie. Then we'll start with some cast and crew. Um, so this is directed and written by Francis Ford Coppola, who co-wrote Patton, for which he was nominated for Best Original Screenplay with Edmund H. North. Have you guys seen Patton? I have seen Patton. I have not seen Patton. Should I see Patton? I don't... I mean, I... No. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a big... Like, it's a big movie. It was a big movie at the time. I, I don't have a lot of memory of it. It was long, and I was young. But it was... Uh, it wasn't as much war as I thought it was going to be. Mm. But... It, it was definitely like an interesting dive into the character of Patton, who is a fascinating human being. Did, w was he known for Patton on the Ritz? I'm, I'm not even. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> he was known for thinking he was Alexander the Great reincarnated, though. Oh, that's cool. Isn't that incredible? That's pretty cool. Like this guy was insane, but also one of the greatest generals to have ever lived. Mm -hmm. It's it's wild. Yeah, he's a wild dude with a wild legacy. So yeah, maybe do because because you don't know anything about him. I don't know so, anything yeah. about him. Yeah, he, yeah, he's important. Watch it. I Educate will. yourself. I, I will. I Educate will. yourself. The only thing I knew is I probably shouldn't be patting him on the head. It's true. <laughs> he would probably kill you for making those jokes. <laughs> I'm, I'm certain. I'm certain. He's I, rolling in his grave. He's rising. I'm a stupid millennial <laughs> making a podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, he, he would look he, at me and I die. He still cares. <laughs> But then going back to Francis Ford Coppola, so he, for this movie, The Godfather, he was nominated for Best Director and won Best Adapted Screenplay, which he wrote uh, with Mario Puzo, um, is nominated for Best Picture for American Graffiti, and The Conversation, where he was nominated for Best Picture and Best Original Screenplay. He was also, in that same year as The Conversation, nominated for The Godfather Part Two, <laughs> in those same categories, <laughs> and all, except for Original Screenplay, but for Adapted Screenplay, again with Mario Puzo. <laughs> Uh, that would have been amazing. Did he win any of them? I, I think he won for the, the the Godfather Part Two ones. Did he win Adapted mm -hmm. as well? I don't think he did. Okay, because that would be amazing if he won like original and adapted screenplay for amazing. different like. Yeah, I just think it's it's, it's amazing that in one year two of his best movies yes. came out. Yeah, That's, that, that I he didn't wrote mean to both minimize. Yeah, like I, I, yeah, what? <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know how you do that, but it's also Godfather Part Two is the first Best Picture winner. That's a sequel. Kind of amazing. Five years later, he does Apocalypse Now, for which he is again nominated screenplay director and picture. He has a weird career. He has a really weird career. I'd love it if sometime, maybe when we do God for the Part 2 or Part 3, we can kind of zoom into the future of Francis Ford and where he's gone since making five of like the most legendary movies of all time. It, he has a crazy story. Maybe too much to get into here, though. Yeah. 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 We already have a uh, lot ahead of us. That's true. That's true. Well, I mean, judging by our timer and judging by how every episode that we do has to be as long as the movie. I mean, we got like two hours and 45 minutes left still, right? <laughs> Plenty of time. <laughs> Plenty of time. <laughs> so he is one of the fathers that they called of the new Hollywood, these directors that actually kind of were the ones that formed our dad's opinions of movies. And then furthermore, ours, the new Hollywood is, is mostly comprised of names like Spielberg, Scorsese, De Palma, Malik, Altman, Alan, Friedkin, Kaufman, George Lucas. Um, a lot of these guys actually hung out and knew each other and were friends with each other and would constantly make movies to one up each other. <laughs> I, I think that's kind of fun. It's really cool. Yeah. It, Ima yeah. Yeah. Imagine if, you know, if we knew five people and we all made movies and we would just make movies to like be like, yeah. Knock the pants off you, dude. Look look what I did. And everyone's like, oh, well, I'm going to go make a movie right now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that creative competition is awesome. Yeah. Was was the Godfather in, to, was it like made to one up anybody else? It was not. It, ah. was, ta it was taken kind of shamefully. <laughs> he, he needed money. He didn't want to do the movie. He wanted to make smaller, more art house European fare, more, more talky more emotional, more deep. And he initially, Francis Ford viewed The Godfather as pulpy and salacious and unpleasant. He, huh. he didn't really want to do it. And it, it was generally regarded as kind of like a trashy story. 
and it took him a long time to come around. That's interesting. I knew it was like one of the top selling books for a couple of years. It um, was, it was, but the rights, for some reason, the rights were really cheap. So I Mario actually, Puzo wasn't even paid that much. I, I actually know why. Um, Mario Puzo, I guess he had kind of a gambling problem. And so he sold them before he should have for uh, like 800 grand. As uh, a, which, and, and that, that's that a, lot of money. a lot of money, but it could have been a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. He hadn't been betting it on the ponies. <laughs> I guess. I, I don't know what kind of gambling he was doing, but. Maybe like competitive, like spaghetti making. <laughs> Clearly. Like, what, what do Italians bet on? Spaghetti? I don't know. <laughs> I'm part Italian. I can make those jokes. My name is Vito, by the way. <laughs> you look, you look kind of Italian though, Jesse. You got the curly hair. I've been told that that's Jewish. Uh, I, no, I was watching in the documentary uh, for The Godfather and I guess they were covering, uh, someone just said, yeah, Jewish and Italian families, very similar, very similar. <laughs> Now that you say that, maybe I can see that. I've mostly known Italians, but yeah. It makes sense. And I will say the one time I was in New York, a lot of Jewish people approached me speaking Yiddish. And I would say, what? Oh, wow. And then they'd be nice. like, oh, I'm sorry, are you Jewish? Like, no, I'm not. Like, this part of me looks so Jewish. And it was like two blocks because there was a big old parade and like a bunch started coming my way. Wow. Like out of everybody on the block. Look, you're so accepted. They like you so much. I That's know, great. right? Good for you. I mean, it might Jewish. be because you dress, you, you dress in traditional Yiddish garb. Yeah. That might be why you, <laughs> you realize the yarmulke is insensitive otherwise, Jesse. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, sharing this screenplay credit with Francis Ford Coppola is Mario Puzo. It was based on his own book, and he shares screenplay credit, right, on all three of them. The third one right. is not based on a book. But he also wrote Superman and Superman 2, which is kind of weird. I didn't know that. Yeah. Also huh. with Brando. Huh, you know, because Brando is, is Jor-El. Yeah. Oh. They had to pay him a lot of money, and he read all of his lines off of, they, he, they wrote them on the baby's front. <laughs> so he could just read his lines. <laughs> <laughs> Brando doesn't really care about memorizing. <laughs> no, 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 he doesn't. Yeah. But those I mean, are the does. only two older Superman movies that are good. I think there's like five or six of them. Yeah, yeah, they, they, all, they all really go down in quality after... The, the moment Superman's end credits roll, the quality starts to go down. <laughs> <laughs> but he also worked with Coppola again on The Cotton Club, which is interesting. Cinematography here by Gordon Willis, nominated only for Zelig, Godfather Part 3, and then wins an honorary award for, quote, unsurpassed mastery of light, shadow, color, and motion. If it's unsurpassed, why does he only have one? It, it is kind of amazing. <laughs> I mean, well, yeah, like it's it's so dark. This yeah. movie is so dark. It's incredible. I it's beautiful. Well, here's 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 the thing. Yeah. It's actually after the 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 shots in the study with yeah. Vito, it's incredibly bright until the murder in the diner. And then it's incredibly bright because it's Sicily. I suppose that's true. It's actually like it's just that you notice the shadows so much. And yeah. I think that that's a really cool technique because he even it's said in the past. Yeah. Even oh, in, in some yeah. interviews, Gordon Willis talks about like people are always telling me, oh, that movie's so dark. And he goes, it's really not. And he says, let, let me take you through the scenes that are dark and the scenes that are light. And he really does. And you go, like, oh, the like three quarters of this movie takes place in stark daylight. Very cool feel. It feels yeah. like it feels like you're in real life, right? It feels like you're not just in somebody's dark, depressing study. You are out doing things in the real world, which, uh, yeah, it gives us a real sense of, I, I guess, scope for this entire film, right? Yeah. It. Yeah, it feels like you're traveling with these characters all the way through and it's changing as you go. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. He also shot Clute, The Parallax View, All the President's Men. Um, he worked a lot with Woody Allen, specifically on on movies like Annie Hall of Manhattan and The Purple Rose of Cairo, which I those are the three I really like. And then he worked with uh, Aaron Sorkin on Malice. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, Sorkin wrote it and directed by somebody right. else. Really legendary guy. Um, feel like he's not talked about enough. Just wanted to make sure we shouted him out here. But starring. Marlon Brando, the legendary man whose credits precede him, the actor who gave all actors a bad name <laughs> as he was notoriously difficult to work with, and also the actor who made everyone respect actors as renegade rock stars. He gets his beginning with A Streetcar Named Desire, for which he was nominated for the first time for Best Actor. Then he's in movies like Julius Caesar, On the Waterfront, Guys and Dolls, Mutiny on the Bounty, and Superman. He won two Academy Awards and was nominated eight times. That's wild. Big yeah, deal. he's a big deal. Uh, he knew which, it. Wait, wait, which two did he win for? Didn't he win for this? He probably won for this. It's probably this in part two. <laughs> oh, no, he's not in part two. Yeah. No, he didn't win for this. 
Oh, no. Yeah, he did. He won for this and, and on, on the waterfront. waterfront. There we yeah, go. The big ones. Yeah. And then he's nominated for a bunch of movies I have not heard of. Streetcar Named Desire. I mean, that's a that's a big one. Yeah, but like Viva Viva Zapata, Sayonara, A Dry White Season. Yeah. I've never know. heard of those movies. I mean, yeah. Uh, Al Pacino, nine-time Academy Award nominee, one-time winner <laughs> for Scent of a Woman, which makes no sense to that's me. so weird. <laughs> hoo I guess, but we all love it. Yeah. I guess it makes oh, sense yeah. that he doesn't win here because I can see why Marlon Brando would beat him out here. But it seems like well, he should have won something for this. He was yeah. nominated. He wasn't nominated for Best Actor. He was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. Which makes no sense to me. There are two There are two leads in this movie. <laughs> and it made no sense to him either. Yeah. He boycotted the Oscars. He didn't go um, because he was like, this is this is bull. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's like. And then he didn't win for Godfather 2 as right. well. It's like if if the Academy decided that, I don't know, if you had a movie called like Judas and the Black Messiah, for instance, that the ki- the actors who played Judas or the Black Messiah, neither of them are actually lead. They both support. They're both supporting <laughs> actors. Neither of them are leads. So they yeah. both get supporting actors. It's fucking yeah. category fraud. It doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. Me. But this is uh, Al Pacino's second appearance on our show after mm-hmm. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's kind of surprising that it's only his second appearance so far. But, you know, we've done 40 movies, right? Ish, Give or take. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Yeah. What's if you guys had to call it just off the top of your heads without looking at any notes? What do you think he'll be coming up in the next two months? What movie would you imagine he'd be on here for again? Ooh, the, the closest one. Wait, is he on here again? I mean, sorry, no. Is he coming up again? That's what I'm. The next... I, I think. I think it's possible. Oh, I thought you meant like recent release movies. No. Okay. I mean, no, on no, no. Pod. On our podcast. Yeah. Uh, shout out. Shout out. Which one you'd like him to be on next? Like. If you had to name in the oh. next like several months, if we were going to cover an Al Pacino movie, which one would you want it to be? Oof. Oh, Heat. Heat. <laughs> Insomnia is just on my mind, man. I can't you stop thinking about that. About about I, I do. I, I can't sleep because of it. No, <laughs> um, I, I just saw it. And it's just like, I can't believe it took me so long to see this movie. It was incredible. Nice. He was incredible. He was so good in Insomnia. Nice. Yeah. I don't know. He would be great too. I, I am gonna. I am gonna have to. Uh, I I do love insomnia, but I, I am dying to talk about heat. Maybe sometime before the year is out. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he's also known for. Um, I called these future episodes: Godfather two and three, Insomnia, The Insider, Donnie Brasco, Heat, and Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Those are all future episodes, right? Oh yeah. Oh, oh, Glenn oh yeah, Glenn Gary, Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Ross. Ross. Yeah. Oh. We gotta do that soon. And if it's the only me, series, anybody. <laughs> it's just that one like three times <laughs> and if it's only me someday I will talk about Carlito's Way The Devil's Advocate Dog Day Afternoon and Any Given Sunday even if it's just me I will just do those by myself I love those so much we also got James Kahn here playing Santino Sonny El Dorado you guys remember El Dorado L- the Lee Brackett Howard yeah. Hawks joint oh okay yeah 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 of course he's yeah. Playing, playing Mississippi oh my gosh he is yeah Holy cow. Yeah. You didn't know that? I didn't know that. That's like, that's one of my favorite movies from my childhood. Yeah. And I never realized that that was James Caan. Very young. That's Very amazing. Little. Yeah. Yeah. Is that one of his first roles? That's yes. got to be one of his first roles. Yes, it Maybe is. Maybe his first? Uh, it's like the second. Wow. But it's, he's very little. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic. I was, I was at John Wayne that early in your career. That's yeah. a pretty big deal. That's a huge deal. And Robert Mitchum. And Robert Mitchum. Amazing. Great um, movie. Do you like El Dorado, Jesse? I'm not sure if I've seen it or if I no, I've seen it. I don't remember it. Very well. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you've seen uh, Rio Bravo yeah. or Rio Lobo, you've seen that. You've one. seen that. You've seen El Dorado <laughs> as well. But El Dorado has this song in the beginning. It's like ride pony ride. It's just oh, like, I do it's remember so, the song till you find El Dorado. Yeah. And, and it's like, dude, it's this poem. It's like uh, over. Po, um. no, you keep making these puns and I'm just like, I by the end of this, Jesse. I'm going to punch you in the face. This is horrible. <laughs> These are like 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 holy things from my childhood. No, over the mountains of the moon, under the valley of the sun, ride pony ride till you find El Dorado. It's beautiful. It's it a beautiful, beautiful little poem. It, it is gorgeous. Uh, yeah, uh, a beautiful little poe. I'm a punch in the poem. Poem. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, he's also in the Gambler, A Bridge Too Far, Thief. We'll do that one someday. Misery, Elf, and Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Wow. Yeah, kind of a kind of a bizarre career. Yep. Last guy I want to mention in our rounding out our main cast is Robert Duvall. Also oh, previous yeah. episode to Kill a Mockingbird. His first movie. His first movie playing Bo, 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 Bo Radley. Boo Radley. Boo Radley. Boo That's Radley. It. Yeah. Yeah. Last time he came up, I mentioned Tender Mercies. And now I will say that I love Get Low. Watch that. 
Never seen Get Low? Watch Get Low. That Dude, rules. Okay. Don't forget Secondhand Lions. Secondhand Lions. Oh, oh so go. great. <laughs> like that one a lot. Okay. No, I told you that one. And, so it's a ton of people. And I'm but, also just going to mention, like, all right, with Al Pacino and Robert Duvall here, they are so different when they are younger. Like, it seems like their acting is different. Their voices are different. Everything about them seems, in my mind, kind of better. Like, maybe it's because they're younger. I, I don't know. What? Yeah, I much prefer Pacino when he is a more subdued guy that he is here rather than the... He, he's always so loud later on. Whenever he talks, it's like it's coming at you like a train. But this one, he's he's almost whispering to you. He has a range in this one that he... Seems like he doesn't have anymore. It's weird. He does. He does still have it, but it's in movies that you would not think to watch. It's in a lot of his like HBO original movies that he's in, like where one he plays, uh, I think it's You Don't Know Jack, where he plays Jack Kevorkian. A lot of that that acting is now in different places that fewer, fewer people see. He it's can not, still do it. He just doesn't yeah. want to as much. Like, well, it's, it sounds like he does want to do it, but it's it's not in the big movies that he's in. He's in these big movies still, and he's always kind of like this loud person. All the way on top. All the way on top, like in yeah. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He does something that's that's pretty great. Like he does a great job. Yeah, um, but he's a loud person. Um, he's weird. He's off the wall. Yeah, but yeah, I, 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 I haven't seen him in a recent movie um, where he wasn't that. If you look up, and his, this is so subdued, it's 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 incredible. If you like, look up his IMDb and like scroll through the last twenty years, you will yeah. recognize maybe an eighth of the things that he's in. It's wild. He yeah. just is. I don't know. I don't know. He just does what he wants to. Now he's old. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you're right. He is really quiet in here. I I, I like that he's quiet. I do miss loud though. I do like loud. I like it when he screams. Oh, I, I don't <laughs> mind it, but like it gives a, he's given like a really good performance here. And I guess I haven't seen that in him. Well, maybe I haven't watched enough Pacino movies because uh, if I haven't seen most of his movies, then it's hard to, it's hard to make a broad sweeping statement about him, but I really like this Pacino in here. Yeah. So should we do Pacino year next year? We just Let's do, do like two Pacino year. movies. <laughs> Let's do it. Sounds great. We'll do the Godfather again. <laughs> I, I mean, I agree with you though, in, in a way, like I, it's hard. Everything about this movie is like, is it topped by anything to me? I don't know. It's partly just like, I have this just firm nostalgia and like this set in stone, like this is the greatest movie ever sort of perspective that might not be totally true, but I don't care. But I mean, I, I, every time I come back to it, I'm more impressed by both Duvall and uh, Pacino. In this. Mm-hmm. They're, they're incredible. Just just unbelievably good. Absolutely. Um, our, well, that would be a good launch into your first impression slash nostalgia if we are there. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Or, or sorry. Is there is there anything? Do you want is there another credits thing? I just wanted I just wanted to talk about John Cazale if I could for a minute. Cause sure. Fredo. Yeah, he John yeah. Cazale has five film credits. They are all nominated for Best Picture, all of them. Really? They are his only five film credits. He is the only actor I know of that has that. He died wow. from cancer at forty-two, leaving behind his loving girlfriend Meryl Streep. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so, in terms of batting averages, it's it's a thousand. He's the only guy to bat a thousand between The Godfather, The Conversation, Godfather Two, Dog Day Afternoon, and The Deer Hunter. And uh, he shares my birthday. That's amazing. Yeah. I just really you want know, to talk about it. There's this him. guy in this town that I grew up in who looked exactly like John Cazale. Oh, really? And I thought for ages, like, I, I'd seen him around and he's kind of a weird looking dude. Uh-huh. And I was like, like, this guy's weird. And then I saw The Godfather. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, John Cazale lives in my town. <laughs> and then I found out that, that he had actually passed away years before. Yeah, about 10 years um, before. <laughs> which I was very sad about for two reasons because right. he was great. And also, the, the guy who lives in my John town Cazale. was John Cazale. <laughs> <laughs> Which, to be honest, I was more disappointed about. Yeah, that's fair for myself. You were quite young. I was, yeah. You better say you were. I like was like twenty three. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, <I'm, I'm> <laughs> it was like last year. <laughs> well, actually, now that I think about it, not that I even know so much about her, but Diane Keaton's in this movie. Yeah, she's oh, in yeah. stuff. She's in. Oh, she's in a ton of stuff. Yeah, she's in a lot of things. I can't remember any of them right now, and I don't have any of them written down. But guys, she's in this movie. Including uh, Annie Hall. She's fantastic. Previously oh, mentioned yeah. Annie Hall. yeah, she's in Annie right. Hall. She's Annie 
Hall. <laughs> yeah, she is a <laughs> huge actress. Big name. Yeah, really do like. I guess really we already like. mentioned that movie, so that makes sense. Um, it does. It does. But also Sterling Hayden, uh, Abe Pagoda, and Talia Shire. You know Talia Shire? Adrian! <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. From Rocky. Yeah. 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 Dude, there's a Talia lot of Shire. people. Also, yeah. uncomfortable fact, we found out that uh, the the woman or the girl that's let's, let's playing like, Al Pacino's uh, Italian wife, what Simonetta, is her Simonetta Stefanelli. Yeah, she was underage when she was like nude on screen. And that yeah. makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah, she was uh, 16. Yeah, 16 years old, goes topless and kind of leaves the acting world because of being typecast as someone who would take her clothes off when people asked her to. Right. And it's really sad because she's great in this role. The nude scene may be uncomfortable because of how young she obviously is. I think that she still delivers a really good performance. She sells how young she is, um, how naive she is. I, 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 I mentioned but also she seems before. like a wonderful person as well. Like, like she sells being young, but she sells being like, a paragon of virtue, nice. kind of, right? Like, yeah. she she doesn't give it up for Al Pacino. Yeah. She waits. She's like, no, you're going to marry me, dude. Yeah. And we're going to go on long walks, and you're going to buy me a gold necklace, yeah. and you're going to get to know my family, and you're going to be friends with my brother, and you're going to, like, talk to my dad. It, it's a fast, it's a well, whole, it's a fascinating, like, storyline, and it's just, it's, it's a bummer that it has this in it. Yeah. Uh, you know, classic Hollywood right here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was telling you guys before we started the show, but for the listeners, I, I, I don't usually get uncomfortable in nude scenes, but I was, I was very uncomfortable, especially sitting next yeah. to my wife and seeing it come on screen. I don't think, I think last time I watched this, she wasn't there and it, I don't know, it didn't connect. But when she was there, I was going, she actually mentioned, that's a young girl. Yeah. I said, no, she can't be that young. And you're like, oh, yeah. Mm-mm, don't like it. Yeah. yeah. Bad Francis, bad Coppola. <laughs> you did a bad thing. Bad, ever, bad Pacino. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, bad man. Pacino. Come on, buddy. Oh, dude. Yeah, he was. Uh, it's it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. Yeah, but you know, it's still kind of what I expect from any given movie. It's sad, but even a classic, even a classic, even a classic. it's all there. It's all something like this is always around. Yep. Yeah. But getting back, getting getting back on track, Jesse. What are your first initial impressions of this movie? Your nostalgia for it? Uh, was this passed down to you by your godfather? Oh, it was passed down to me by my dad. My dad loves this movie, and he's just your like, dad father. My, my <laughs> actual father. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. I guess it wasn't like a super intentional thing where he's just like, "Come watch this," but like, oh, this is back in the days of like cable TV when they would advertise like you know the Godfather's going to be playing on Sunday night or whatever. And then, and then you tune in Sunday night and then he would always get like super into it. And one day there was like a whole like trilogy marathon and he sat down and watched all of it. And I, and I watched them. Oh my like, gosh. Oh my, <laughs> oh my gosh. He watched all, all of them? three with commercial breaks. Um, that's, like, that's like a 15 like, hour day. Maybe one after the other, like every, every day or something like that. Oh, anyway, okay. it was a long time. Um, I, I remember there were periods where they would like show it all day for a week or something. Yeah, or yeah. all three would go all day for a week and yeah. stuff. Yeah. This man, just that that was back in the in the good old days when you couldn't choose what you wanted to watch. <laughs> Except I, I think we might have rented it anyway. I don't I don't remember the exact age or anything. I just remember my dad being really into it, like talking all about it and how these were two great movies that won Best Picture and how the third one sucks. And and talking about like Michael and Vito Corleone and like going around like quoting The Godfather for like a, a solid like couple weeks. But I only saw like bits and pieces of it. I don't. I don't think I sat down and watched the whole thing till I was in high school, and I was super bored. I didn't like it. Yeah, yeah. As as like a teen, I was like, I don't huh. really know what's so engaging or why this is considered such a great movie. Like it's really slow. There, I don't there's, know why. There's I don't like, know why there's like two shootouts. <laughs> you know, there's like two shootouts. That's it. Like, yeah. yeah, there's very very little killing in this. Yeah. Yeah, there's not a whole lot of it's action. Fun. It's fun. very, it's very much, it's all about dialogue and people talking about weird family politics where you're still not quite sure what the particulars are. So, and it lasts for three whole hours. As a teen, was not attracted to that. And then I watched it again years later in college, and I liked it more. I liked it. 
and then I watched it a few times after after college. And each time, each time I've seen The Godfather, I've liked it more and more. And frankly, I've just connected with it more. I don't really have nostalgia for this, except that it was always talked about. But the more I've watched The Godfather, the more I'm like, man, I understand the struggles of Vito and Michael. <laughs> like, especially now that I'm a dad, right? Yeah, dude. Yeah, you guys are Vito and Michael. Yeah, I understand you guys now. <laughs> oh, what? Oh my gosh. I've been sitting here for half an hour without even thinking of that. <laughs> Longer. I've known you my entire like like for ten Most years. Adult life, yeah. And and I've never thought of the fact that that I'm going to take the reins from you and drive this family into the ground. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a coda from your life. Man. I never wanted this for you. I never did. I wish that you would make olive oil or go to the military. Or I did that, Father. Oh, I'm slipping. <laughs> Man, I'm wow. so glad I'm not Sonny or Frida. Yeah, yeah. No, you're you, you're, you're Jesse. I wish you were. I wish you were Tom. I wish you were Tom. Oh, that would have been like cool. That. Yeah, yeah I, cool. I do love Tom. Your hair's kind of reddish, or it, it was more reddish when you were younger. Yeah, it's getting getting dark. Yeah. Is it this low res camera, or is it or is it still light in the sunshine the way I remember it? Uh, it's probably light in the sunshine the way you remember it. I don't know. It's like 117 around here, so I haven't been out <laughs> a whole lot. Get get Liz in here. I need to know. No. <laughs> well, hey, that's that. Yeah, I think that's just about it. Like I connect with those characters now, and I think we're going to talk about more later on. But yeah, I I love this movie now. How about you, uh, Michael Michael Corleone? <laughs> um yeah man so i saw this so i actually watched this with my mom and my sister the first time i saw it and i was probably like mid-teens 14 or 15 maybe 16 hmm. and i remember this movie wanting to watch it earlier and my mom said no we're gonna watch this as a family mm-hmm. and i'm gonna say when it is and it, and you accepted that with with grace and 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 patience right yeah I, you know i think that i was pretty patient about this there was a lot of other stuff that i wasn't graceful and patient about mm-hmm. but i went ahead and watched things like gladiator and other violent bloody movies sure. um that she didn't know were violent and bloody um before <laughs> gladiator before that must this. be fun yeah gladi- <laughs> it sounds great russell crowe whatever but with this one like we waited to watch it until i like i was 14 or 15 and we sat down and we watched it and it blew my mind I was so, so amazed by this movie. And we kind of like, we talked about it afterwards. I I just, I had never seen something this incredible mm-hmm. uh, before. And it, it totally changed what I thought movies could be. It was the first, I, I think it was, I mean, I don't know. It was the first time I watched The Godfather. Like, that's it. That's the only way I can describe it. Every time I've seen it since I've liked it more. Uh, I've I've found more to like about it. I found more in it. That's that's incredible. It's beautiful. I I've watched it. I don't know, 10, 15 times since then, and uh, I am excited for the next time I do. It's amazing. And like most people out there, I compare things to it, and I I think about parts of it all the time and, and try to understand it. And like you, Jesse, as I as I'm becoming a father, I guess I am a father as I'm becoming, you know, the dawn of my family as I'm building my family. It's becoming more, I I don't know, it it resonates in new ways. I think before I might have uh, resonated more with Michael in this movie, but, you know, I'm getting a little bit older. I do have children. I'm starting to resonate a little bit more with the dawn, Mm -hmm. Uh, understanding sort of the, the way that the way he has to lead, the way he understands how, how understanding people is how you lead and, and putting them in the right places, but making them feel loved in a way or respected. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a fascinating, Michael, it's just Michael, a my fascinating son, My thing. son, you are finally seeing yeah. the way I've been. <laughs> as you say, those words oh, reflect Vito. back on our relationship. <laughs> Jesse, you as well. I'm going to call you Tom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But what about you, Vito? Do you have any uh, actually, uh, deep seated nostalgia? No, I don't. Actually, that's the funny thing is um, I did not really? see this until I was in college. Oh, wow. I uh, I remember it very distinctly, though. It was um, it was October of my freshman year. I was hungover. Nice. Um, I was 
lying on uh, at the time my bed I didn't have a bed. My bed was my desk. Like I had the flat bed frame and then I put my mattress underneath my desk and I slept under it. Oh, nice. Yeah. And I had like a little cocoon so I could like prop my laptop in there and, and I could put my headphones on and watch movies that way. Imagine if you did something like that now. Like, like... I, I've, I've asked and my wife, is, <laughs> wife says, would I be down there with you? I said, no, no, that's my space. You would be up top. <laughs> I said, bunk bed marriage. Bunk bed marriage, right guys? <laughs> I... I am not nodding to this. You no. you should pitch it to your wife. <laughs> Bunk bed marriage. It's fun. I'm a fan of 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 the bed thing. It's too well, too warm. Well, I, I'm just gonna say, like, you can conserve a whole lot of space that way. It's true. You just need a twin. Bunk bed marriage. I, I'm wondering about <laughs> about your guys' marriages at this point. Also, <laughs> like, this, is, this has been like a not a dream, but it'd be really cool to have like a loft in your bedroom where you yes, can like I walk up there. That. You know, that's that's what bunk beds remind because like I, I remember also in college, like one of my old roommates when he was envisioning a room without me, he was, <laughs> he was making plans for like a few different layers in his room that he was going to make. It never worked out, but ever since then I've been so fascinated with the idea that one room can have multiple layers and what you could do with that space. So yeah, I, I'm sort of here for that. Nice. I, I'm, I'm here for a loft in. bed. I mean, I want it to be a king size loft. That's my preference. Mm -hmm. um, <sighs> but you know, the heat though, there is something to that because the higher up you are, the hotter it gets. So like maybe it's a, a, a loft that you can be up in like during the winter and you can- oh, dude, Yeah, know. come to Phoenix. That's exactly what you want. <laughs> uh even even here in southern california it's been it's been getting a little uncomfortable mm -hmm. did you know recently it was like a hundred <laughs> it was like a hundred degrees dude we didn't know what to do i almost died it was a hundred degrees at 8 a.m this morning it was like 90 degrees at 8 a.m and i just that was awful and then by noon i was like it's a hundred i i saw i saw personally saw two people melt <laughs> We're made of different stuff down here in Southern California, Jesse. Different stuff. Not like it, you desert folks. In my car thermometer, I, I left and it was 108. When I came back half hour later, it was 117 and wouldn't go down from there. Wow. Wow. It's it's bad. It's oppressive. <laughs> this is this is a terrible time of year. And it's gonna last until like November. It's gonna get hotter, isn't it? Uh, well, it's a heat wave now, so it might get a little bit cooler, and then and then rains come in the middle of Phoenix summers. Oh, that's oh. right, I forgot about that. Didn't yeah. didn't a couple years ago? Didn't it get so hot they had to like cancel all outgoing flights? Yeah, the tarmac will melt. It's like the planes. Um, I I think I think the the tires were sticking, and planes have a hard time getting lift in hot weather. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. I, I was out there for one of those like summer rainstorms. I guess it wasn't a summer one, but it was like it was combined with a with a dust storm. <laughs> so oh, yeah. mud storm. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> oh, dude, yeah, it was. Those, it was that's what I'm talking I was on about. Top of the that's, mountain. That's awful. Oh, okay, I, I was on top of a mountain, and we see it coming across the desert, like <laughs> yeah. at the city. So it's like outside the city, and, and me and my my wife, we weren't married at the time. We're like we're on this romantic hike because we were like long distance dating or whatever. Yeah, and we're like, oh, that's interesting out there. And then it's just coming and coming across the city, and the city's like lit up. But then there's a lightning bolt, and just power goes out <laughs> everywhere. It's just dark, and we realize, oh, that's that's the flood. It's gonna, it's the end of the world. And we start racing down the mountain to try <laughs> to get to our car before before we get swept off the mountain. Nice. It was amazing. Yeah. But obviously, you both survived. Yeah, maybe. maybe I could be a ghost. Yeah, but yes, right. we, we survived. Yeah, when those things come, it was that very cool. Flash floods come and all that. So that stuff is intense. And but if you're home, it's so great. It's like a waterfall outside of your house after it's been so hot. And then sometimes it's so windy that it starts going sideways. And if you walk out there, you just get drenched. It's so wonderful. <laughs> I love it. I wish I could be there for amazing. one of those. That sounds like fun. Yeah, yeah. Is it worth the 117 degree heat? Oh no. <laughs> good to know good to know do not fool yourself right. yes he says no so anyway uh rewinding all the way back to bunk bed marriage yeah, and prior right. to that uh prior i I, I was not married and did not have a girlfriend and was probably depressed about that or some other things that were going on in my life and i decided that i would just i, I cracked open my eyes the world was bright and bleary and my head hurt 
and I opened my laptop and I started watching The Godfather. And then when The Godfather was over, I got up and went and got lunch and I came back, I lay back down and I watched The Godfather part two. <laughs> I never watched the third one. I just did the two and that was it. And I did like the first Godfather at the time. I loved the second one. Although that could have been because I just eaten lunch and was less. You were back right to the land yeah. of the living exactly. a little bit. Exactly. And just paying more attention. But honestly, The Godfather is just a really comforting movie to watch. You know, it, to have it on. The music's beautiful. The images yeah. are great. It's a it, Even if you haven't seen it before, it's a very reassuring, familiar kind of story. We've seen it everywhere in popular culture. Yeah. You know the beats almost. I can, I, I can imagine that being like a really good hangover movie. Yeah. Just like in general. It just feels soft. It's and it, soft. And it lasts for so long. Yeah. Too. You don't have to change it. You can just stay in the same place for a long time. <laughs> exactly. Barely blinking. <laughs> but then over like what Mike is saying and, you know, what you guys are both saying, the more times I watch this movie, the more times I love it. And this being the fourth time I've seen it now, second time with my wife, I, I really love it. I really, really love this movie. I think yeah. this movie is, is, is incredible. And I think I will definitely show it to my kids for sure. For sure. For sure. I wonder, I, I guess 15 is the right, the right number, I suppose. But what I would like them to remember me for this movie as well. That would be nice. I just don't know if, if I don't know how many kids this is going to land with at 15. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if there's something they need to come to later. Like, I guess I guess that was that was my story, right? It didn't land for me, but it landed later. And it landed for Mike. Yeah, you know, it's like a 50 50 shot here. Yeah, but either way, you know, in college, it'll work. Yeah, yeah. I, I've thought about this too. What I really want is I just want to be like watching this while they're awake, and they're just going to get bored and run off. I know that's inevitable because if you're a kid, this movie is really boring. There's nothing engaging about this. You have to pay attention to politics and really, really quiet talking. Vito yeah. Corleone is so hard to understand. Um, yeah, yeah. Like, Especially once he gets his jaw broken. That's like Michael. with subtitles, oh, it sorry. becomes yeah, yeah. a lot better. But it, he's got it, all those those uh, the cotton balls in his mouth, right? Yeah, yeah he's, he's got the cotton down balls. Like this. Yeah, <laughs> and and then Michael or Al Pacino is he's talking so quietly. Everybody's talking really quietly. Maybe besides Sonny. So, Sonny and 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 uh, Connie, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. You always know Connie's going on. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think fifteen is a good age. I would like my kids to just like come in and see me watching this and leave the room because they're bored, so that they become familiar with who Vito is or uh, and Michael are. Or all right, maybe all right. This is a random thought. I was familiar with The Godfather growing up because in random Nickelodeon and Disney cartoons, there were <laughs> constant knockoffs of The Godfather, like all yeah, the time. Yeah. Specifically remembering an episode of Rugrats. Yes. Yeah. 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 Where they talk about the Godfather, and then yeah. it's like Angelica. I think she's sitting there. Yeah. Or maybe it's Tommy. I can't remember which one of them is the Bob father. Yeah. They have to like go to him and then there's like some bodyguards outside. But there's a lot of stuff like that. References like everywhere. To the point where I kind of knew what The Godfather was as a kid. I'm not sure if my kids have that because right now they're just watching like Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood and Franklin. And it's definitely not in those. <laughs> hey, it's a Godfather <laughs> coming over to your house. <laughs> uh, He's going to make you an offer. <laughs> you better accept it. <laughs> That's awesome. Although Franklin slept with the fishes, that actually be okay for him. That would be great. <laughs> it would be good for that, an it probably be better than sleeping where he does sleep. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I think I'd... Um, I think I think 15 is the same for me. I'm trying to think about how like it was set up for me because I kind of knew about it from from my my family friends who talked about it. I don't th I think they saw it around the same time that I did. My mom was kind of fine following their guidance. You, you had the benefit of a, kind of a big neighborhood of yeah. kids that were close to your age and your parents were friends with their parents. Yes. Yeah, so they they kind of they all got together and were like, hey, we're going to watch this movie now or that movie now. But and usually like we would all watch it at one person's house. But with this one. We I, all I'm gonna, split up. I'm going to start a Slack channel now, yeah. just just because of this. We need to start like another thread about like what we're watching with our with our kids yeah, this particular a, week. Because yeah. sometimes, just for you listeners at home, when we do these episodes, sometimes these are definite like watch with the wife, watch by ourselves. Every now and then, there's like a watch with the kids. Yeah. But I often wonder what you guys are watching when you're not 
watching the movie that we're going to review the night before we have the episode. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you know? It's always Star Wars for us. For for me and my kids, that's what it's been for like the past few months. Wow. These last a long time, especially if yeah. you can't get up through a full movie with a five year old and a two year old. Right. We've been doing Octonauts. You're still you're still on the we're Octonaut still train. Still on the Octonaut train. Yeah, very, very Octonaut educational. Yacht. It's very educational. No, it's not. A, we're gonna call it. It's the Octonaut yacht. It's the Octo it has it, to Octo be. Explorer. I think. I, I don't make the rules, Mike, but that's definitely in the rules. You know what? You should. This is an ongoing show. You should write to the producers and be like, "You missed a huge opportunity by calling it the Octo Explorer and not the Octo Yacht." It would be the Octonaut yacht. It has to be the two. Oct- the not yacht. Just the not yacht. I, you you would do a great job as a showrunner. <laughs> oh, recently, yeah. recently, my son has really been wanting to watch Spider Man. Though <sighs> he's constantly oh. calling for Spider Man. Oh, That's oh awesome. is it, does, does does he remember? Does he have like f- faint memories from when we he, you guys were over over here and we did Spider Man one and two way back in the day? I think I think he has that, and I've showed him like the old '90s cartoons, which frankly they always get bored with. Mm. Like it, there, the '90s a lot of dialogue, versus, yeah. Yeah, that's not a good one. It's not a good one to do. And I've been, you know, when we did Into the Spider Verse, I talked then about like how I you shouldn't show that to your kids so early because <laughs> like that's like a subversion a little bit of Spider Man, and or at least like I, I don't know. It's a it's a change up. It's it's, it's resting up. some of its yeah. story on things that they assume that you know. Yeah, maybe. like especially specifically with the Peter Parker stuff in that one, right? Yeah. So I've been holding off and showing it to them because of that. But now I'm like, what other age appropriate Spider Man do I have? My kids are clamoring for it. So I think the I kids, might have... the kids, they want Spider Man. What, what do we got for them? They do. My two year old yeah. really wants Spider Man. What? What can I show? I'm not going to show him Tobey Maguire. That's going to be, you know, maybe I'll start with that. No, no, it's too freaky. It's too Green freaking, Goblin's like, pretty scary, man. Yeah, yeah. Like, can't, like I don't think Green it can Goblin's be done too, yeah. all the way through. Yeah, you know, there's a couple. If you skipped a couple Green Goblin things, like him talking to himself, it might work. Or anyway, him uh, screaming anyway. in the burning building. There's a lot of like scary moments in there. There are. Yeah. Yeah. This my, is my when job. like all the recommendations and like when we show these to our kids are actually being put to the test. Because now yeah. I'm like, oh, well, when I actually show it to my kids at this age, yeah. and for Spider Man, I think I'm right on. But for Into the Spider Verse, maybe I gotta I gotta go back and say like I'm willing to show this to my kid when they're two or three. <laughs> my my yeah. my three and a half year old daughter has seen that movie uh, three times, and she she loves it. She asks for it all the time. We actually had to put a pause on it because I was tired of watching it. Wow. I didn't I didn't want to see it. I didn't want it to be ruined, yeah, you know, right, by overwatching. Right. But she asked me, like, I don't know, once every two weeks. You know, that's a great it. point. That's a great point. Like the that that's something that we haven't really factored in to our ratings or whatever about like making sure that this great thing that we like isn't isn't overwatched. Yeah, or something. Because yeah, that could that could def I could see that happening very easily. Because I know she wants to watch it with me because she knows I like it, but yeah. also. I watch, I rewatch movies all the time, but I also do it like once a year. Yeah. And for kids, that's just not an option. If it's been a year, it, it didn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> these these movies need to be rewatched constantly. You know, yeah. I need to put this movie on, and then when she's seven, she'll switch movies. But ooh, we watched a cool. We? we watched a cool Disney movie. Um, like you know how Disney has the nature shows. We watched Dolphin Reef. Freaking beautiful, nice. by the way. Like just beautifully shot, and the kids loved it. They nice. are they are very into oceans right now. Dolphins. So that's 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 a oh that oh your your, yeah. your wife was asking like do you know any shows about dolphins and I was like no I watch this one about whales and she says that's <laughs> that's not dolphins I, said, oh, I know I know I'm trying yeah <laughs> I don't kids, consume a lot of dolphin content <laughs> my, my kids are gonna are are planning on being marine biologists uh, where where the hell are we we're at, uh, well we just talked about when we will show it to oh. our kids and also I guess oh. I guess I never ultimately answered the question I'll show it to them when when they're fifteen but of course before I do that. I think I'm going to have to pitch it to them. Yeah. That's Wait, can I say, um, you know. oh, you know what? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go into the pitch it. Cause I, I don't know if I have a pitch exactly, but I, I'm going to share like what my, how it was pitched to me. Okay. And it worked. I think at least it, it worked for me. Right. Uh, and that might not work for everybody, but, but they're the, the, your kids are like you. So, you know, yeah, maybe, but they're also like my wife. So that's true. She is not sold by things that you are sold on in the way that you're sold on. Them. Yeah, Maybe. Maybe I don't know. She it's just we just watched that last year for the first time, or The Godfather. We just watched it for the first time. She was like, "How did I miss this?" So this is how it was sort of pitched to me, and I think this is how I'll probably try to do it for my kids. If if it seems like it'll work, I mean, we've got 
we've got a lot of years before we get there to see how their personalities develop. But the reason why she said that she didn't want us to watch it before we watched it and why we then watched it when we did was she said this is a, an incredibly important movie and it's a work of art, like a real work of art. And it's not, you know, it's not going to be a lot of violence and stuff. And I'm paraphrasing, but like, it's a serious movie Mm -hmm. and there's some serious things in it. It's Mm -hmm. dark. I was like, oh yeah, I love dark. Yeah. Because, you know, I was 15. Um, She's a twisted mom. (laughs) Yeah. And, uh, and that's kind of how she, how she, like, I wanted to watch this movie because everybody watched this movie and said it was incredible. So I didn't need to be sold on it. Yeah. And I feel like with my kids, it's going to be the same sort of way. Like it's going to be in sort of the the milieu of what they're around because like it's it's always going to be. And so it's more about like why we're not watching it yet. Mm-hmm. And then like in preparation for watching it, like be prepared. Like we're not just walking into just any old movie here. Like this is this is a serious movie. Yeah. And so that's that's kind of how that's how I'm going to prepare them for. I guess it's not a pitch. It's not a pitch because you're saying you're saying the sales work has already been done for you by culture. I guess so. Yeah. Like, like everyone wants to buy this. Yeah. But, but I, I don't want to sell it yet. I'm holding on to it. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Holding on to something, making something the forbidden fruit. That is the best pitch. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's what my parents did uh, with all movies. (laughs) (laughs) And look at you now. Look at me now. (laughs) My mom did that with Braveheart. I, of course, had seen The Patriot many times before. Sure. She finally let us watch Braveheart at like 19. It was very oh, weird. Oh, you finally got permission? Yeah, it was really weird. <laughs> when you were like, a consenting adult? Like, yeah, like for some reason I hadn't gotten around to seeing it before then. And then like my sister and I were like, hey, mom, can we finally watch Braveheart? She's like, I don't know. This is Mom. Do you have any? I'm 19. I'm going to leave and just watch it by myself if you say no. I I could have watched this at any time. At that point, I didn't even ask my parents for permission for anything. I just didn't. didn't It wasn't so much permission. It was like, hey, mom, I think we're going to watch Braveheart tonight. She's like, I don't know about that. Well, you can go to your room, mom. (laughs) Jesse, do you have a hard pitch here? I don't think I have a hard one. Like Mike is saying, I had a pitch to me both by society, like I was saying, with cartoons and stuff. And also, there, there's that great scene in You Got Mail, which is like a staple <laughs> in my family growing up, especially from my sister, because she used to watch it all the time. But there's that scene where where Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, they're emailing, and Tom Hanks makes a reference, like, go to the mattresses, right? And then Meg Ryan's like... Well, what is that? What is that from? He's like, from The Godfather. And she's like, why are all men obsessed with The Godfather? And then Tom Hanks is like taken aback and starts like talking in an Italian accent, like writing an email back, Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> but that's when I also realized that like The Godfather is an important part of being a man. That is something that I that I have to tell, at least my son, I have to be like, you know, if, if you want to be a man, you got to watch The Godfather, the greatest man movie of all time if if you want to grow some hairs on your chest if you want to learn how to make spaghetti if you want to learn the days of the week here's the movie for you yeah oh yeah. i just saw vito's nipples <laughs> <laughs> he's showing off the very little bit of hair that he has on his chest i'm not i'm not a walking man rug like you are sir <laughs> you say that like that's a bad thing i mean do you need a coat in the winter? <laughs> do you, do you I, shed your winter coat for the summer? Again, you say like say that like it's a bad thing. How often do you have to vacuum your couch? <laughs> again, you say that like it's a bad thing. This is why my wife married me. She knew she would stay warm. If, if she, she, she knew she vacuum. could have just gotten a dog. <laughs> this is one of those movies that I actively really want to pass down to my kids. And this is one of the greatest movies of all time. I think that speaks for itself. This has gone down in history as a great movie. And I love the idea of a family business empire. Because (laughs) it's not just any two of those things. It's all three of them. It's a family business empire controlling a whole region. And that succession of power being passed down from the father to the son while one of them might be running it to the ground and you're trying to figure out like if Michael's going to run to the ground or if Vito is actively doing wrong and maybe he slipped up and that's why he got shot. Like there's a lot of like really cool things going on here and it's in itself is worth watching. 
So my father was born in 1962. Uh, so he would have been 10 years old when this movie came out. Oh, yeah. And so he never really had much of an attachment to to this movie. He'd seen it, but didn't have much of an attachment. So 72, then, so some fathers that are a little bit older could have that sort of attachment, seeing it when they're a young man and it kind of following them around. Like, um, yeah. But then that that gets hold, held over from the, the boomer slash Gen X, right? And that gets presented to millennials because those boomer Gen Xers are the ones that are making those cartoons that we're seeing when we're kids, right? I mean, the makers of the Simpsons, there's like a five minute long reel on YouTube <laughs> about all the times that they spoofed the Godfather and the Simpsons. And I'm sure that's not even like a complete compilation video, but there's some of those out there. You talk about Rugrats. So as kids in the 90s, we're seeing what Gen Xers have made for us and what boomers have made for us. They're influencing our tastes. But there's been now, you know, some almost 30 years since the 90s here, at least you know, since I was born and came in and was experiencing movies and TV. Yeah. So I'm influenced by that, but I don't see as many Godfather things now, mm. right? Like the Sopranos had a ton of that stuff and I see it kind of declining a little bit. Like I've, I've been starting to see some posts from some up and coming, you know, Gen Zers who are in high school or whatever on Twitter talking about the Godfather. I mean, like, have you, do you guys know about this movie? I'm wondering two things. Is this going to be like a big cultural revelation for a whole new generation of people who are making things? Is, is the Godfather going to make more of a resurgence into culture like we remember it being when we were younger? Or is this going to be one of those kind of things that maybe fades slightly? I don't know. And so thinking about that in terms of our kids, when they, in like the 10, 12 years, when they get older, in 10, 12 years, what's the landscape going to look like? What are people going to be calling classics at that time that they're focusing on? So I'm wondering, I'm going to take the alternative pitch then. I'm going to say instead of a cold pitch where they already know it and they know where it's going to happen, I'm just going to take an alternative. I'm going to take it like culture forgets this movie. Okay. Okay. Yeah. IMDb top 250. It stops being listed at number two and it just like goes away. Right. <laughs> Everyone's like, that's some boomer shit. <laughs> Leaves it behind. <laughs> so my kids grow up and they only know the Godfather because I'm watching it. And they're like, dad, what's that really long movie that you're watching? I go, I can't tell you about it. I, it's dark. It's, it's sad. It's full of murder and pain and loss. And they go, what is that, Dad? I said, no, we can't talk about it. We don't talk about that. And I, and I, and I, send, I send them in the other room to get me a drink. And when they go in there, they see, that, they see you, Mike. They see you, Jesse. You come to me. You shake my hand. And then one of you closes and the, the door. door closes. <laughs> <laughs> it's Never shrouded me about in... my business. Exactly. <laughs> Never! This one time. I, and then that, that's what I'll do. As then the one time I let them ask me about my business, that's when we sit down. I pull back the velvet curtain on our TV that I've installed precisely for this occasion. <laughs> <laughs> and I put on my 8K restoration <laughs> of The Godfather. And we watch it and their minds are blown. And uh, the next day they start wearing business suits. Um, they start addressing me as Don. And my life is exactly perfect the way I've always wanted it to be. That's less of a pitch and more of a dream, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> I think it's going to work. Good. I, mean, I think it's definitely going to work. In this yeah. alternate yeah. future. In this alternate future. Good. <laughs> culture has forgotten the Godfather. Yeah. As it will. Yeah. So then maybe maybe turning this into a snake, starting off with some favorite scenes. Ooh, favorite um, scenes. I am going to say, I'm going I'm to say the baptism. The baptism. Yes. I'm going to say the baptism starring a uh, young Sofia Coppola. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the it's baby is first, Sofia Coppola. Her, is she credited? <laughs> she is. It's, well, it's an uncredited role, but it, Francis is like, That's my daughter playing the son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gorgeous baby. But the scene in question is it's near the end of the film. Uh, Vito has passed on. Michael is in charge of leading the family and he's being hemmed in from all sides. He's trying to make a cross country move to Vegas. He's trying to legitimize the Corleone family. He is fighting off a lot of people who are trying to betray him and the family all at once. It seems like everyone's turning on the Corleones. Well, everyone's got in for him, right? Yeah. After the Don dies, everyone's like, all right, now we're going to test Michael. Well, I think, I think they're, they're thinking that if he's, if he's weak enough, then they can take him out and then they can run the drug trade like they want to. And they can yeah. sell the kids like they're always talking about, which Don Vito would not have allowed to happen. Right. But the drug trade is where the money is. And they want the contacts. They want the, the politicians. They want everything that the Corleones have because they're so powerful. Right. Mm -hmm. And Michael decides in an impressive young man's way of thinking that fuck tradition, fuck the rules. I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to have take them all out. Everyone kill everyone that opposed me. They're dead. And in this beautiful sequence where you really see this is and this is also the time where I really think that Michael loses his soul right here. 
is at the yeah. baptism of his son. First godson. Yeah. 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 While he is renouncing Satan and all of his evil works, he is making a pledge as a Catholic in a church. And he's he sidelines everyone. And while this murder is taking place that he is set up, he is living that duplicitous life. He has stopped being the man that we saw him at the beginning, where he doesn't want anything to do with his father's business. He's a decorated war hero. He's a civilian. He's legitimized. And he flips the whole thing over and becomes maybe even more evil than his father ever was. And I think that not only is it visually beautiful and incredibly impressively exciting, but it has such deep narrative weight that I almost feel like a cold weight hits me in the stomach yeah. when I watch yeah. that scene because of the implications it has for who he is. And it's, it's the tragic fall. There it is. There's rock bottom for him, yeah. you know, morally speaking as a character. Yeah. yeah. I, I will say and, that like coming in and watching sections of the Godfather when I was younger, like you would see Michael and, you know, you see him in his army uniform and being against the family. And then like, I remember walking in later and suddenly he's like, you know, he's being pronounced a Godfather at a church and he's making all these vows. And that scene struck me so much. Him saying, like, do you renounce Satan and all his works? And him saying, I do. Being and then juxtaposed the... with Clemenza coming in with the box and then, like, unsheathing oh, the gun so and amazing. just, like, Shocking. blowing, a, like, four and, and, people away. And that massive swelling organ that yeah. cuts yeah. the scene. You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's incredible. incredible. I think I saw that as a young kid. Because, you know, it's funny because that is a dark scene, but there's not that much blood. Like, it's not no. gruesome. It's not gory. No, Barzini gets shot in the back work. and he rolls down the steps. Like yeah. you, you don't even get a close up of Barzini's death. And he's like the 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 orchestra the orchestrator of all this resistance to the Corleones, and he's just shot on the steps and yeah. rolls down. As he's running away. Yeah. It's yeah. not any it's not like the death of like Luca Brasi, right? Which is really horrifying. Oh yeah. Really horrifying yeah. to watch. It it just happens in quick succession. And you're more sort of you're just shocked at the implication of what this means for these characters. Yeah. I think much more than you are shocked by the actual violence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I will say yeah. there's the and two, two of the deaths have stuck with me in my, in my memory since I saw it. That's Mo green getting shot oh, through the eye shot yeah. through the glasses, which is like, it's, I don't know. Beautiful is a good word for it, but it's the only word that comes to mind. It's, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and also the scene with Tataglia, I think in, in bed, with his with whoever the pimp Tagia the pimp yeah um and the, he gets gunned down with uh in the sheets in the sheets with machine guns with tommy guns yeah yeah that always stuck with me too partly because it's like well what was she like why is she getting killed why does she have to die she's just you know probably a prostitute or something definitely yeah. a prostitute dude something about all those death scenes seem almost poetic yeah yeah uh, operatic right it's yeah. it's this grand collision of the two juxtaposed images of, of the church and hell, right? Mm -hmm. Smashed together. It's been done so many times. Now we're very, very used to seeing juxtaposed images of things that are good versus with things that are that are awful. Like at the end of Goodfellas, where Scorsese plays Layla over the discovery mm -hmm. of all the bodies of the, the Lufthansa heist yeah. guys. Yeah. Like and we, we've just, we're used to this now, but this being the first one, I still think it's probably the best one. It's, it's just yeah. so shocking. It's yeah. so electrifying. It's so unexpected. And know? it's yeah. slow. It's slow too. It's yeah. not, it's not fast. It like, like, time. like there's, there's speed involved. You don't stay with anything, but there's so many people who get killed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And like the guy who gets stuck in the, in the moot in like the, what is that? They the, lock the him, they lock him in the revolving door. door. Oh my God. That's, <laughs> that's like, awesome. I, I've been terrified of that ever since. <laughs> I am not a crime boss, but I'm just terrified of it. I don't, I try not to go through revolving doors. Yeah. Oh, I got stuck in one once. It was terrifying. It's well, all terrifying because these are all like important people, so to speak, yeah. in this world. Connected. And they're all just dying. That's it. Yeah. This is, because, this is all because, it takes apparently, which means. Because Michael just decides to stop playing by the rules, right? That's the only reason. Because Don Vito's like, he's old. He wants to keep the peace, right? We got to, I hate this. No more wars. We had the olive oil war already, okay? We did the war. No <laughs> yeah. more wars. But then as Clemenza says, every, every 10, every 10, 15 years, we got to do this, you know? <laughs> Get out the bad blood. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I will say as like an 11 year old, it's stuck with me the rest of my life. This is the scene I remember the most vividly. That and the, the horse in the bed scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because like, you don't forget those moments. You know, I was kind of underwhelmed by the horse in the bed scene. I had heard that's like most of what I'd heard about with the Godfather, like, oh, horse in the bed, you know, in conversations over dinner, like horse in the bed. What? Yeah. 
And then I saw, I was like, oh, that's it. He's caught in bed like, with the horse. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. If you don't know that it's coming, like I yeah. did when I first saw it, I thought the guy was going to die. And no, it's just his horse's head. And you're like, oh, it's just his horse. Oh, it's his <laughs> horse's head. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Car- Cartoon, like, who is yeah. worth like five hundred thousand dollars? Did he say six hundred? Six hundred. Yeah, I think. Yeah, nineteen seventy-two. <laughs> yeah, so you're going from horror to relief back to horror again, yeah. and it's like so quick. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a brilliantly done little move because, like, the way they already show you that horse earlier, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. you think that you know an offer that you can't refuse will be that he's dead. That's what you've learned about uh, an offer you can't refuse. Mm-hmm. right so you yeah. think he's gonna be dead but he's not he's not missing half of his body he just happens to have blood all over his bed yeah and and his most prized possession taken from him uh, I, I was really struck by that this time i mean like we're jumping off of the baptism scene but i was really struck by that this time around i don't know i i was less underwhelmed by it than than ever before meaning like it, i thought it was as good as i did many times since the underwhelming moment. Uh, but because of that, because it's like, yeah, like this is what he values most. It's not his life. It's not anything like that. No, his life he wouldn't care about. He's like, kill me. Yeah. You still won't get the part. It's like, no, Don Vito, like he finds a thing that drives people. He knows people. And that's how he rules by understanding them, not necessarily by having an iron fist and just killing everybody, but by like, I, I'm stepping on on another part of the show, I think. <laughs> but uh, but but by understanding the people and, and manipulating them by finding their weakness, right? Which is well, different for everybody. I will also say that was Tom Hagen that did that too, right? Yeah, but I well acting on Don I mean, Vito's behalf, right? But as consigliere and as the foster child, like Vito says, you know, Vito always calls him my consigliere, right? Yeah. But then when Michael comes in, Michael wants nothing to do with Tom anymore. Yeah. No offense to Tom, right? He says, yeah. but I need a wartime consigliere. Yeah. And I think that Tom is much more like Vito, right? His approach seems much more like Vito, like very considered, very calm, very deliberate, very careful, but but every motion is perfect, right? Yeah. And Michael is Michael's playing a different game, but you're right. Yeah. This is, uh, yeah. We don't, I don't want yeah to well, we'll talk about that more later. Yeah. But your favorite scene, Michael. Oh, Yeah. Dude, it's hard to pick a favorite in a movie like this because it's just every scene could be the favorite scene. But I will never, never not just fall in love with the opening monologue. Mm-hmm. I believe in America. Mm-hmm. In America, I made my fortune. Bonacera, Bonacera. You come to me on the day my daughter is to be wed. And you ask me to do murder for money. Like, it's, it's a fascinating scene. The whole wedding, the whole first 30 minutes is at this wedding. And it's just the perfect way to start a movie at at any movie, like weddings, funerals, whatever. Like they're incredible. You see people in a perfect light, I guess. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. Um, You're able to get all of the different characters. And there's so many in this movie. Opening scene tells you so much. Even just the way it starts. It's black. The scene is black for so long. There's nothing on the screen. And then the music starts and it's still just black. And then he comes in, you know, I believe in America. Bonus era, the undertaker. And there's a trade that occurs here between Don Corleone and uh, Bonus era, the undertaker. But it's not a trade for money. And he comes and he says, these two American boys tried to rape his daughter. Mm-hmm. She didn't let them. And he's very proud of the fact, this, this undertaker. He says, I, I raised her in the American way. It's it's a fascinating sort of expression of like being an immigrant in America, um, trying to adopt American values and then having that all sort of crumble and crash down when you see sort of bad people doing bad things. This guy has never come to Don Corleone for help. He never invited me over for a cup of coffee. Yeah. You only come to me when you want to pay me for something. What's wrong with you? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I, I love this scene because it's like telling you who Don Corleone is. Yeah. He's a man who values what? Friendship. He values relationships. That's all that really matters. He's having all these meetings today, including this one, because it's his daughter's wedding. And because he feels so generous, he won't refuse anything. This idea of like him and family and that being like the primary motivator for his entire character is so strong and it's coming across so clearly right here. Well, you know what? I don't know about that, man. I don't know if it's that friendship is his primary motivator. 
Because what does friendship mean? Relationships. Connection. I, I think that they're his primary mode of operation. But I think his motivator is power. Because what's exchanged here isn't like it's not money. And it's not friendship. They call it friendship. He calls it friendship. It, it, well, okay. It, it's fascinating because, because he's like, you've never treated me like a friend. And I'm offended by that is what he says. Yeah. There's truth to that. There's truth. He's like, you can't ask me for something without being my friend. I don't do things just for money. I do them for my community. Yeah. But it's not in like, a, I care about the community. So I'm going to raise it all with my work. It's like, I care about being the guy in charge. He's not a friend at the end. What he has to do is call him Godfather and kiss his hand like a lord, like a king, like a savior, right? This is not a friendship. And I think you're right that it tells you about who the Don is, but it's that he uses this. He he doesn't exchange for money. He cha- exchanges for something much more valuable, favors, right? But what those favors are can be as simple as I don't want his mother to see him like this, mm-hmm. right? Uh, try to I need, do, I try use, to, I need yeah. you to use yeah. all your skill, all your talents. Yeah, yeah. When he try, when he fixes yeah. up Sonny. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think you're, I think you're partway right. Like sometimes I wonder if Don Corleone is just so confused that the way he gets to friendships is through power. I think. But I think actually the, the answer for this is in Godfather Part Two. Um, I, I think you're right. There's also some things here, especially in this whole wedding thing, that are very telling for me about about who Vito Corleone is. And there's something like so fun about this wedding with all yeah. these kids running around everywhere, so many families. If you want to go to like a laid back fun wedding, this is like my dream right here. Your backyard, bunch of families. It's like if you think about a billionaire's wedding and you, what that usually look like, it doesn't look like this. It's not your backyard with like kids running around everywhere. It's like in a fine restaurant with everybody wearing hoity-toity suits, drinking but the, hoity-toity but there's, drinks. But there's no, like, drunk old uncle making sex jokes in Italian, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, you always need that. You always need that. You you have uh, professional singers, you know, uh, just bring people up. I mean, they have professional singers, but only because they're part of the family. I actually think, I, yeah. I think to, to marry both your points, I think what, what you might be running at and why there might be any cross purposes at all is I think this is the fundamental contradiction and paradox at the heart of the mafia, right? Is that there's this artificial blending of family, friends, work, money, and morals usually tied in with with the Catholic church for the mafia anyway. And it all gets sort of mushed into this stew and nothing means what it meant before it got in the stew of organized mafia. Right. Right. But now that it's in the stew, everything kind of borrows from everything else, but it's all kind of tainted underneath the business. Right. And there's things that are personal, but really everything is business. Right. Everyone's always saying, Oh, it's not personal. It's not personal, but it's, it, it always ends up being related to the business in some way because the family is business. Right. So even in me trying to to describe this, I'm having to borrow different terms from different places. But I, I think that's what's happening is this this fascinating contradiction at the heart of the mafia. It's family, but it's business. Right. And that's why it's kind of hard to talk about relationships and what they mean is because relationships are the power. They're also the only thing that matters. They're also the only thing that you need to get. There are a lot of things. Right. And there's no real true friendship because everything's transactional, which we know is not yeah. like not friendship. Yeah. So it's so hard to even talk about in this way. And I, I'm wondering if that solves anything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I think, I it's think not, you're definitely right. Yeah. Yeah. But there is something to the, the primacy of relationships here. And just one other scene in this, in this beginning that I want to point out is when uh, Luca Brasi yeah. goes in to talk to him, right. With his rehearsed speech. Oh, and it's beautiful. A bunch of kids run in at the same time and interrupt yeah. him. You would expect a man who is obsessed with power to like hit the kids or something. Right? Yeah. Or at least yell at them. Instead, nothing. He lets them run in. He lets them run out. But he keeps his attention focused on Luca Brazzi. I don't know quite what that says about Vito Corleone, but it seems to say something about like his balance of power and family all in all in one little shot. And well, I love even that. He even seen Luca Brazzi to begin with, like he doesn't he really want, want to. to see him. Like Luca Brazzi isn't on the list yeah. of people to see him, but Luca, he didn't expect to get invited to the wedding. Dude, and he wanted to say thank you. And he's not asking for anything. He's just nope. here to say no. thank you. And he's been yeah. practicing like the whole time. 
Godfather, thank you so much for inviting me to your daughter's wedding. <laughs> May that first child be day, a masculine child. A masculine child. <laughs> on the day of your daughter's wedding. Yeah. Okay, so apparently that was, I think that was like the first take. The actor was, I read that the actor was terrified. Yeah. Um, well, he's, he's, being, I think he's a professional wrestler. <laughs> yeah, and like here he is acting with Marlon Brando, yeah. the greatest of the greats. And he actually screwed up the line. Yeah. And that's what they kept in. Nice. And then they filmed like him practicing beforehand because they're like, this is perfect. Yeah. This gets the character, which, uh, which is another great part of that scene is when uh, Kay is like, Michael, why this, this that man is scary. Th- that man's <laughs> that scary man is talking to himself over there. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, Oh yeah, that's Luca. Brown. <laughs> Don't talk to that guy. <laughs> Don't talk to that guy. Okay. Oh yeah, man. Oh, another thing too. Like, I think my favorite line in this movie is, um, when Michael says, that's a true story. That's it. Like like that line at the end yeah. of telling about how uh, Johnny Fontaine got out of his contract. Yeah, because Luca, Luca went in with a gun. <laughs> yeah, L- Luca and my father. That's a true story. It's it's yeah. like it's just like the most perfect piece of of line reading I've ever I've ever heard, like of acting, because it's it says so much. It's both like there's pride and shame and like fight me and also save me like everything's in that line i don't know yeah. man it yeah. it's it's crazy like the way he says it i didn't say it right yeah you're right i don't know i, I, I did get that all from from al pacino saying that line that way yeah and, and then when he's telling that story you're learning so much too you're also learning what it means for what it means for somebody to have an offer that they can't refuse yeah. which is a term that keeps changing throughout this movie I've altered the arrangement of our deal. Pray I do not alter it further. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, man. I, I do love that line. That's a true story. Simple. True story. It's direct. And you learn so much about Michael. Yeah. What, what's yours, Jesse? All right. So mine is, I would argue, the biggest turning point for Michael. It's the diner murder at... I think it's Louis. The so, Italian-American cuisine. Right. He goes and he meets McCluskey <laughs> and Salazzo. This is after Michael, in one take, apparently, he just, like, gives his plan, how he is going to personally murder McCluskey and Salazzo. McCluskey being um, Salazzo's, like, right-hand man who's, like, who's the police chief. Yeah, right? he's a captain. He's a captain. And so nobody can murder McCluskey because if you do, everybody's going to be on you, right? Because never been done before. A cop. You can't kill cops. Well, he, no, he's he's a captain. It's they, we've never killed a captain. They say. I think you can get rid of a dirty cop, but a captain is like that's that's like a federal thing. We don't even yeah. want to fuck with that. Yeah, and Michael is the one who volunteers and comes up with this plan on the spot where they are going to figure out where the meeting between him, Salazzo, and McCluskey are going to happen, and they're going to tape a gun to a toilet somewhere so that way he can go in to the bathroom, grab the gun. And then come out and just shoot them both. And then I love all the prep beforehand where they're going over like, oh yeah, just drop the gun. It's okay. Everybody's going to be looking at your face. No one's going to notice your hand. You walk fast. You don't run. You come out and you just shoot them. You don't wait for it. I love when Clemenza asked him like, what do you do? What do you do after you shoot them? He says... Sit down, finish my meal. I was like, no, you don't. Like, <laughs> like, no, stop playing around. You're an idiot. <laughs> no, you drop the gun and walk away. He's like, like I, he's like, I killed a bunch of people. Okay, like, shut this up. is not what you do. <laughs> I, I, have, I have to say, yeah, he's just it's, wrong about everything. Yeah, I have to say, it's very impressive that Pacino Michael survived getting punched by the 14 fifths of McCluskey. Like, it's amazing. <laughs> Good for him. Uh, the 14 nice one. fifths nice of one. McCluskey. Thank you, um, thank you. And then live to, live to watch the movie about it, yeah. Um. yeah. <laughs> so there's so much prep for this scene, and my heart is always, like, pounding by the time Pacino's, like, picked up by these guys, because he's picked up by McCleskey and Salazzo and driven to the restaurant. And it, it's just them. That's it. And they finally get there, and you're like, well, is something going to go wrong? Is there is there a gun? back there and even though i've seen this movie multiple times every time it happens i'm always like how how does he do it again because like it's just it's such a out there idea for michael the straight man right the straight guy of the family the the war hero to just go out and randomly kill these guys in the most 
personal and business oriented thing that their family can be a part of right now, which is a war. They sit down at the restaurant. Salazzo and him just start speaking in Italian and there's no subtitles. I really appreciated that. I actually like they don't they don't subtitle the Italian. It's always just Italian. Yeah, they, they subti- actually, in that scene, I read that the reason why that was not subtitled was that Salazzo spoke too fast for them to subtitle it. Great. Um, but and it, it works so it works well. Beautifully, because yeah. you just start looking at Al Pacino's face, and he's yeah. making so many facial expressions. You can tell that this character, Michael, is trying to act like he's calm, but is also panicking. Trying to figure out, is there a way out of this right now? Can I say anything? No. This is the guy that killed my father. Or, like, shot my father. I have to kill him. And you see that determination set in. Just all in this guy's face. And then he goes to the bathroom. Finds a gun. After ten seconds too long searching. Because at first you're like, holy shit. They didn't plant the gun there. And then he finds it. And he brings it out. And then he goes against the plan, right? He's supposed to shoot them immediately. And instead he sits down. And then they talk for a little bit, and he just shoots him. And then does not drops drop him. the gun. He, he walks to the end. He walks to the door and drops the gun at the door. He like lifts his hands up and <laughs> throws it. He kind of like like side arms it away. He does not do as, as it's very obvious. Said. He no longer has the gun. It's just like he doesn't put his arm down and drop. He just is like he just casts right. Yeah. It's funny that he just disobeys all the rules yeah. and gets out. I think. He's I think. That's, that's, well, I think what it shows though yeah. for his character is that he. He doesn't do things the way that someone would expect him to do them, right? I think it's actually very key to his character. I think that is is a soft lead up to the baptism scene, is that he's told by the veterans, this is how you do it, and he doesn't do it that way. He doesn't He listen. does something similar, but like yeah. louder. Yeah. More violent. Yeah. And he Scorched also, earth. He also <laughs> doesn't listen to them because he doesn't shoot Clemenza in the head twice, yeah. nor does he shoot McCluskey in the head twice. Yeah. He shoots McCluskey in the throat and the Salazzo. head, and then yeah. Cle- and then sorry, Salazzo, not Salazzo, Clemenza. Yeah, Salazzo once in the forehead, and they told him double tap them both. You know, he's it, like one after another thing. He doesn't do it, and I'm, well, I'm not disagreeing that he's that he's not panicking, but yeah. I think this also there is there's character work happening here. I think you're right. I think it's character work, but mixed in so like seamlessly with what somebody yeah. in a really tough spot would also do. Oh, they told me to shoot twice. Well, I definitely shot him in the head. And then, like, I have to turn around and shoot McCluskey. I missed the head. I get the throat. But I'm going to double tap and shoot him in the head. I think so I think another part kind of this... Of following I think another part of this, too, though, is that he's seen action. He's yeah. a war hero. Yeah. So I don't think he's actually panicking as much. I'm not, I'm not saying there's no panic. He's definitely sweaty and worried, right? But he's he's been in war. Yeah. Actually, to, I guess to add to your point, like there's something that I noticed this time around, but before when he's at his father's hospital, right, and he's visiting him, and then he tells the baker to go downstairs and pretend like he's like guarding him or whatever. Yeah. He tells the baker to put his hand in his pocket, act like he has a gun, like guarding. Right? And yeah. then the people drive by, and then Michael puts his hand in his coat, ready to draw his gun, which you know he has, and shoot those guys. And then they drive away. And then the baker starts shaking uncontrollably, trying to put a cigarette in his mouth. Right? So much so that Michael has to grab the lighter and light it for him because he's not capable of doing it. And then there's this, like, split-second thing where Michael just looks at his own hands, noticing that he's not shaking, and then goes back to what he's doing. Like, for whatever reason, Michael is calm. Yeah. Yeah. I guess maybe in the diner he is also still calm and maybe there is no panic. Maybe there's just a little bit of endorphin rush. Maybe there's a little bit of a choice that he's trying to delay. Like, am I actually going to be part of this family permanently in this Mm. business? I read more rage than anything. Like he wants to kill these people from the moment he sees them. And uh, he's just like angry that he has to wait partly, but also this worry more about this is the step into the mafia than necessarily worry that they're going to kill him or find him out or something. But I mean, like he's definitely concerned, like very concerned when he's in the bathroom and can't find the gun. But I mean, like I I've, I've always read that and maybe, maybe it's wrong, but um, I've always sort of figured that as like, he's worried because he's like, I can't kill them. Like I, I can't kill these people. Like this is my one shot and it's not there. Right. When than... his back is turned. 
No, when he's like reaching up and trying to turned. find the gun. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you don't see his face. Yeah. yeah, you don't see his face. Yeah, I, I, I mean, he's just moving frantically. I mean, I guess, I guess that could be there too. I, and then, I never and then read he it like, as he's going out, he like, he stops, he does his hair, like he pats it down and calmly, calmly walks out calmly. I think it's just probably a storm of emotions. It's like, yeah, we're, yeah, we're all focusing yeah. on, on different aspects, but yeah, I think they're probably think all so. there. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I think like, I've always read it that way, but I think that that's a really good point. Like there's definitely yeah. fear as well. Yeah. Dude, I, I love all that. I love how this is a multi-layered scene. Filled to the brim with so much stuff going on, raging in Michael's soul. And you're seeing all of it. It's all actually there. And then he finally yeah. kills him and walks out. That's what's so great about this whole movie, man. Everything is just filled to the brim with with all the different like aspects of, of humanity. It's incredible. It's incredible. Like every every emotion that could be felt is showed as being felt by these people. It's, it's amazing. Uh, well, those are our favorite scenes. You have a note here, Jesse. Would you like to ask this question? <laughs> I think the note reads, why suddenly change his mind? Uh, <laughs> yes, it's, it's, I mean, I mean, Michael, why suddenly he changed mind? <laughs> Jesse, well, mind why he changed suddenly because <laughs> change mind he does. Why mind, why mind suddenly? Why change? <laughs> why change mind? Merman. Merman. <laughs> <laughs> Another great father-son movie. <laughs> oh, that's going to be a Father's Day special for sure. Uh, something that happens after the diner, right? After after he's being chased out of America, he goes to Sicily, gets married, and this whole sequence is so strange, right? He meets a girl, and then, like, minutes later, he says, I want to marry her, right, to her father, she gets who is, murdered. Who is the local Don? Who is the local Don? Uh, so is, he, is his father a local Don? Her he, father he, is a local he Don. He owns the restaurant. He's he's part of the organized crime. Oh, I mean, I think everybody is. I think he's more so. Okay. He's, he actually called a Don in, oh, the, in okay. the summary. But oh, okay, I didn't know that. So I'm I I don't want to cut in your point, but just the context here, right? He goes to Sicily. He's he's being protected by these two shotgun wielders, right? And he immediately sets himself up at this place. He's, it looks like he doesn't know how long he's going to have to be. It's going to have to be at least a year, but it could be longer. He doesn't know. And no one know, back home knows where he is. Right? Yeah. And so I think with this whole thing, him leaving Kay behind, they can't. he can't talk to Kay. He can't talk to anyone on the mainland. And he goes after the Don's daughter. Right? And he gets her. And he's kind of throwing his weight around a little bit. Everyone else is like apologizing to people. And he's like, no, no. You know, I, I'm not going to do that. I think what's it being implied here is he's kind of setting himself up as a Don in this place. Like, if I can't ever go back home, this is a viable option. Hmm. I got a wife. I'm ingratiated with the local mafia. I have the respect of them because of whose son I am. And I'm smart. And I've done these murders. And I start to see some of this, like, crafty thing coming out of him. Like, when they they first describing Apollonia, right, at the at the restaurant, and the, the dad walks away all huffy, and they're like, oh, it's his daughter we're talking about. Oh, no, we should apologize. And he goes, no, bring it back out here. Tell him to come back out here. Like, that's such a power move, especially when you are the offending party. And I just see him start to make these little steps. Uh, what, do, what did you think about that? Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I, I've always been confused. It's like, I see that as possible. Yeah. Him throwing his weight around, I guess I hadn't I hadn't thought of that. Like he's trying to establish himself in a new place because he might be there for forever. I guess I, I had also thought maybe maybe he's just horny and wants to pass the time. Oh for it's sure. Possible. <laughs> but that could have been with anybody and it didn't have to be through marriage. I, I don't think he's the Don. I, I I'm gonna say I'm gonna say straight up. So he's living with a Don there. At near the town of Corleone. So, and that's, that's the name of the town that they're all living in. It's his family's town in Sicily. And so he does throw his rate. He's definitely throwing his weight around, but I don't think that the, the owner of the restaurant is a Don. I'm sure he's involved with organized crime because I think a lot of people were in Sicily. It was all over the place. Like everyone was a part of it whether it was just kind of how you, how you lived. But I think that, that her dad is just a restaurant owner. And so he's throwing his weight around. I, I always thought that what it was was like, Oh, he, you're, uh, you're right. You're yeah. Right. <laughs> he's living with the Don. Um, 
who is probably another like he's a don he's a lord yeah it's, it's also it's involved sen- with organized senior crime. vitelli okay yeah so he marries the the town keeper okay right okay but so Fine. so i think it was it's kind of like and may, maybe jesse this is what you were thinking it's kind of like he's perhaps seen um a way out by like hey you know what i'll live in sicily for the rest of my life and like this will be great i will be the lord of corleone and i'll have this beautiful young wife and it'll be great. I'll never go back to America and have to deal with this stuff again. Is that kind of how, how what you were thinking, Jesse? I would think that, but one thing that draws me away from thinking that is that right before he meets Apollonia, I think her name is, mm-hmm. he says, when can I go back, right? It seems like his whole thing is about, like, when can I go back to America? That's what's constantly on his mind, and somehow this has changed it. It's weird to me that you would get married to somebody in another country and get settled there when it seems like you're focused on going back still because i never see that focus leave michael yeah i i think i think he's balancing the two things i think he's like this is my backup that's my main right yeah because he's he's a survivor well it's that tension this that's what this movie is all about is that tension he's like i want to go back but i like i want to be the, the dawn i want to be involved in this and i think that you hear all of this in that line that he says to Kay of like that's a true story it's this tension that he has of like wanting to be a part of it and then wanting to have a normal life and be a normal person and not kill yeah. people the normal part is also what i was thinking of like is this his chance to have the yeah. innocence right to have this innocent woman with this innocent family and I, we had just been describing it as like a power move, as like establishing a new dawn. But what if, I guess the way I had originally seen it was like the the opposite of that, going against that entirely. Like this is a last resort, your Hail Mary to have a normal life. You meet a girl, you get married, you got a house, you can, you get some kids or whatever, and then bada bing, bada boom, life is normal. <laughs> bada bang! Yeah. Yeah, but I, I think there's also in here, like, he's kind of maybe trying to follow in his father's footsteps and have, like, a traditional sort of wife. Even, like, he's he's balancing both, like, both of these desires of having a normal life and being out of the mafia and then, like, also ruling the mafia because that's what he kind of wants. And maybe in Sicily he can do both and he won't have to confront his brother Sonny and, like, all these other people that he's killed. Okay. And, but also, like, getting married to a traditional, like, he goes through this whole traditional sort of courtship process and everything yeah it, it's it's fat i think it's mostly just this you know combination of all these different desires and motivations that that's in him because i think right before he meets her don tomasino has told him that he can't go back anytime soon basically um, which is maybe maybe what kicks him into high gear of finding a wife soon as well and he's probably also horny you know yeah So with Michael and Cicely, it seems like there's a lot of ways to interpret what's going on. And frankly, it could be all at the same time. He could be going for a normal life like his father was, still trying to be a Don like he was. He could still be having all that. And then suddenly, she is murdered? Yeah. Yeah. I know car bomb meant for him. Car bomb. And that, that solidifies him as the dawn back in America, it seems. Because the next time you see him, he's going up to his old girlfriend, Kay, and saying, like, oh, yeah, I've been back for a year working for my dad. And he's creepy looking. Yep. He and, looks like the man in black. And suddenly it's creepy, justifying everything that he said was wrong about his father's business beforehand. So, like, her... Apollonia dying in Sicily seems to be the thing that suddenly changed his life or his mind, or maybe that was the the final step. And then with the complete downfall being the baptism, I would say. It seems here, now his path is, is already kind of laid out for him. Yeah. To some degree. And like, what what was it about Apollonia dying? Was it like the revenge that he wanted, do you think? Well, we don't, we don't see the revenge until... You, there is a deleted scene in Godfather 2 where he kills the guy, but I don't. you don't see it actually until Godfather 3. But I, me personally, I think that he, he when he when the car bomb blows up and he's been betrayed by Fabrizio, I think he realizes that no matter where he goes, this is all going to be the same. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter now. The, the, the path, every other path is over, right? 
his actions will catch up with him. His family's actions will catch up with him. And uh, it's, it's almost like he's kind of done here. Like he has to now be a Don. Otherwise he'll be dead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, like he flew across the world, tried to live a normal life in a, in a small town. And there was a car bomb there. Yeah. Like who expects a car bomb from, you, from like, his, from the guys hired to protect him. Yeah. Yeah. Although, just to be fair, he probably could have picked a better hiding place than the town name that has his last name. <laughs> yeah, just, That's true. just it was just near it. <laughs> I just, I, you know, Corleone. That's not that common of a name. <laughs> Where I'm do you Corleone. think this guy went? All right, do we have any towns in Corleone? Look at those first. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there is a town called Corleone. Yeah, there's a big mansion, a lot of guards. You know, they say there's this young dude who showed up recently and had a big old wedding. Everyone was there. He was like, oh, kind of messed up. Is this place in Sicily? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. Uh, So I think you probably could have tried, like, a little bit. A little harder. Um, I think that... uh, Wyoming? (laughs) (laughs) I don't think they knew Wyoming existed back then. I don't think it did exist back then. It it was a good purpose. It it did. It did exist. It did exist. And as John Cazale says in Doctor Afternoon, though, John Cazale also does not know where it is. Because when he and Al Pacino are are locked in the bank, they're both bank robbers in that movie. Um, It's a hostage situation. The cops are outside. And Al Pacino sits down next to John Cazale. He says, when we get out of this, what country do you want to go to? And he goes... Wyoming. <laughs> and Al Pacino said, that's in the United States. I'm robbing a bank with someone who doesn't even know where Wyoming is. <laughs> that's great. Uh, just don't ask Fredo. Does that, okay, is that is that question, did we did we just answer it sufficiently for you, you know Jesse? What? Is there still open? For me, that makes way more sense. The whole, basically what I wanted to know is what happens with Michael and the whole Italy sequence, and now it seems like I at least have Multiple answers, but he's a multi-layered character, so I would expect multiple answers for that. Which is him wanting a normal life, wanting to establish himself in a new place, and maybe, maybe worm his way into like being in control of of an area uh, as a new dawn, and then that murder making him realize that he has to escape and has to has to be a dawn somewhere and has to face the bull by by its horns, basically back in America. Because what else can you do? That all makes sense to me. But in terms of kind of in terms of Michael's approach, though, like we've said that he's kind of an unconventional guy. He's very smart. He's very direct, though. Right. And Vito is direct in some conversation, but some of his actions don't seem direct. Some of them seem he seems kind of wily, you know, and Michael is for all of of, of his intelligence. He has very little charm in dealing with his underlings or his enemies. He's he, not a charming man. No, he's brutal. Yeah. And harsh. And that's a weird juxtaposition to Vito. But even weirder, right, is that for most of this, for some of this movie anyway, a good portion of it, we talked about uh, his older brother, Sonny Santino, yeah. is Don while Vito has been shot. And might and might die. And in Sicily. Yeah. yeah. And Sonny is just, Sonny's insane. Sonny is a crazy person, completely ruled by his emotions and his appetites. Yeah. Hmm. I just want to say, having watched this movie in in hour chunks, and this movie is three hours long, it's almost perfect that the for the first hour it's Vito Corleone that's Don, for the second hour it's Sonny that's Don, and for the last hour it's Michael that's Don. Very like, nice. It's split into like perfect thirds. It's beautiful. Father, the perfection eldest in me son, loves this. Yeah. Second eldest son. Yeah. 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 Um, Our youngest son. Youngest. Yeah. yeah. He's the youngest. That's right. Frida. Frida is gone. Frito. <laughs> yeah, he's in Las Vegas. Sunny, Sunny, you know, it was a bad Don. Frito. <laughs> Don't even Michael, try. Poor Frito. Michael. <laughs> so with those three styles, like, honestly, I still think that, I mean, I, I think that Vito is still the best Don. At least people seem like they're happy. <laughs> no one yeah. seems happy when Michael comes to power. And people seem mostly like very scared and very worried about the next thing that Sonny's going to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because they're all they all have like they all have different relationships with people. People, I feel like people like Sonny to a degree. Like he's at least I think he's fun. He's fun to be around when he's nice to you. He's crazy. He's horrible to his wife and he kills people very quickly. He has no control of his temper or any emotions. But he's also it, it does seem like he acts like like the idea of family in sort of the classic mafia way is extremely important to him, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. 
Like yeah. uh, when when uh, when Carlo tells um, his wife, I can't remember Connie. It. Connie, shut up, Connie. He says, "Don't talk to your, don't talk to my sister that way." Yeah, you know, and, like, beats, <laughs> and beats him up. Oh like, my god, so good! <laughs> it's such a great scene. <laughs> Kick the yeah. shit out of that guy. Yeah, Freaking totally Carlo. deserves it. Yeah. Um, okay, I I actually thought of something watching it this time around. Like they constantly talk about the separation that you need to have between family. In business, especially since this is a family business, that's a really hard line to walk. And it seems like Sonny errs toward making everything family oriented. Everything's about the family, and any any slight against the family means he's going to use the business to get revenge. Huh. It's like it's almost like the the family yeah. is coming for us. The business is. The business serves the family. And then you might, for, you might have for, been like better suited back in like uh, some sort of ancient war times, you know, like tribes. <laughs> I think that's where Sonny should have been born. I think he, yeah, I think he probably would. I think that would, that mentality would really work. And then, and then, but Michael's like the opposite. I think he's business first. Family serves the business. Yeah. Right. I, I think he was, especially in Godfather Part 2, you get a heavy dose of that. Because there's also like a juxtaposition, like uh, uh, T- Tessio, Tessio, Tessio is the one who is the big betrayer mm-hmm. in the end. Tessio and Carlo as well. Yeah. Um, but Tessio more so. And he says, you know, tell Mike I had nothing against him. Um, I always liked him. It was just business. Yeah. Is there any way out of it? And no, Tom dude. Hagen says, no, not this time, he, Tom. He almost, he almost like... <sighs> I kind of like that because that showed that Tom Hagen isn't always like, ah, oh, bummer rap. He almost smiles. He's he, almost like, yeah, man, you fucked up. <laughs> he does, but it's not a happy smile. It's it, like, like one of the reasons why, like it's almost happy, but there's there's a frown and a sorrow on the side of it. I don't know. I did not like, see sorrow. I, I, oh, I, I don't know. I, I just I just fell in love with Tom Hagen and this, this, this watching of it. I've never felt, felt so much uh, just joy in watching someone on screen. But Michael, like he, his execution of all the other Dons, it's business, but it's also per, it, like, it's almost more personal to kill them all off because they slighted his pride or something like that. It, it, it's not like they tried I, to kill, they killed Sonny. They tried to kill again, his again, dad. Like, and, again, again, I don't and know about, gonna go about after ranking him. primacy because again, like these things are all smushed together. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I wasn't trying to rank it. Um, as much as say, like, it's interesting because it seems like, yeah, business comes first for him, but it's also like, it's not really family necessarily that comes, he's doing the, comes he's doing, first. Mike's doing the hand. Mm, the family. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's, it's almost like, uh, I don't know, almost a personal pride thing mm-hmm. um, yeah. that's sort of been born out of. I think he's a, he is a very prideful man. Yeah. Um, I think Michael is for sure. Even when you see, I think you see that even when he walks into the wedding and he's wearing, he's, he's wearing his, uh, I mean, it's he, he's wearing his military regalia and, but like, but like then the he, but he sits it, down, like, right. And then people come over to him, yeah. right. Fredo comes over to him. Yeah. And it, that's just like a big thing for him is like Michael plants and people come to him. Yeah. And that's a big power move. He doesn't go find his family to say hello or sit with them, which is what I would do if I came to a family wedding mm-hmm. late. I would go to my family. Even even Vito does that in some early uh, wedding scenes, right? He's, I mean, he has his, like the dawn chair, but he gets up from it to go talk. Like he even goes and slaps the the Frank Sinatra dude. Right. And goes and talks to Luca Brasi, right? They don't talk behind the desk. They talk yeah. face to face, like familiars. Yeah. Yeah. And even when he's talking about like, oh, you never invite me over for a cup of coffee. Uh, like he's up and like wandering at the bookcase at this point. Right. Like he goes to people. But Michael. Yeah, you're right. Michael's a planter. Michael is just like, I'm sitting here. You're going to come serve me. Which is to me, if you think about like the ultimate businessman, that is what the ultimate businessman does. Whereas yeah. a family man, like he, you go to other people. Even even when Sonny is done, right? And Michael pitches his plan. Michael pitches it sitting down. Yeah, and yeah. Sonny, Sonny goes, goes to, him. to him, even though yeah. Sonny can sit in the dawn chair. And so Sonny makes fun of him, and Michael turns around and he sells it to Tom. And Tom goes, "No, oh, yeah, that would work." Yeah. Yep. And yeah, no, it's he's a man, Michael. I love Michael, but what a dick. Yeah. My, yeah, um, Michael's. 
terrible. So then contrasting the three dons uh, that we have here and the consig- the conciliary that can never be a don, the adopted German-Irish yeah. foster child of Tom Hagen. Yeah. He acts as second in command. It's He acts as the family's lawyer, very special lawyer, one client. He, he It feels like he would have been don if he had been naturally born. I mean, uh, born of the family, Italian, Sicilian. Um, maybe crowded out by Sonny, but maybe after Sonny goes, it would have been Tom. And even then, even if it was in Vito's power to hand off the Dondom, I feel like he would have handed it to Tom. He trusts Tom more than anybody. He loves Michael, right? Yeah. But he really trusts Tom. He doesn't, yeah, he doesn't want Michael to be the Don. He wants Michael to get out. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want Michael to be a part of this at all. He wanted him to be a senator, a governor. Yeah. Yeah. What, but in, in this movie though, what's his role? What does he do? I mean, I, I, I think I think it's fascinating the way he interacts with each of these people because he's the advisor. He knows his place, but he it, it, uh, sort of is under them. But he also recognizes that he's above them in many ways. Like with Sonny, you know, uh, I think Sonny says something that's demeaning to him as like not really being part of the family, and immediately apologizes. And says, <laughs> and, well, and and he, this is I think the only time we see uh, Tom get angry, and he says, "I was as much a son to him as you were, Sonny, and you know that." Yeah, it's incredible, and you get the sense like you get so much family history in just that one sentence or that one that that interchange because you see like he's fought to be considered a part of this family forever. And he's fought against and with Sonny on everything from baseball to like to killing people um, forever. And he is the trusted advisor of the Don in a way that Sonny has never been and could never be. That Michael was not because he could have he could have been so well in a way. And Fredo will never be also for different reasons. It, it's it's a fascinating role in in and like the Don trusts him in. He he advises the Don, but it's more like the Don advises him, right? Like you have to say more about that. Like Tom acts more as like the the one who he he's the not exactly an enforcer, but he's he's the extension of Don Vito Corleone, right? Yeah, like Don, he goes Don, out. Don says, "I need this," and then he's like, yeah. "Okay, I'll call that guy." He calls him. Your Don requires a service of you, exactly. Which is a little bit different from, I don't know, a counselor, right? A counselor says, like, this is how you do it. I think this is just the role of the, the conciliary, right? Is that you're, you have to, f- you're like, you're like everything for him. You're his girl Friday. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like, well, that's how he is with Vito, not in wartime. And I think that's why he, he's not a war, like Sonny says, you're not a wartime conciliary. And, um, in what Michael says, Vito that. later says that. Like, yeah. Well, it, he also, he can't be because he's a lawyer. Right. He has to be, he has to be kind of unstained by a lot of these bigger activities. Like he doesn't take the letter from K for Michael. Right. Because the courts could prove then that that would mean that he knows where Michael is. Yeah. And so he, he might be lying when he says he doesn't know where Michael is, but you can't prove that he's lying. Right. right. Yeah. I, uh, okay. I also have the question. What does it mean for him to not be a wartime conciliary? Because He's the one that cuts off the horse's neck, right? Or at least arranges it. He arranges it. He definitely didn't do it. I, I I am certain that what happened there was that he called up the Don after dinner and said, hey, you know, what are we going to do? He has this horse. And yeah. the Don was like, cut off its head and put it in his bed. Yeah. He was like, great idea, Don. I'll have it happen. I'll, I'll make well, it happen. I could also just see him doing that because he, I, I think he can read Vito Corleone's mind. Basically, yeah, yeah, I think yeah. he could, but he's all—he's not a brutal man. No, he's not violent. It's a—it's out out of character well, for him. But also, the, remember when Michael comes up with the plan to kill uh, McCluskey and Salazzo, Like he—he he tells Tom, and Tom's the first one to agree to it and say that's it makes, a good idea because it makes sense. It makes, sense. It makes yeah. sense. Right? sense. But he doesn't have any part of it except to say that makes sense. He's almost he's, he's more the brain, a sounding board. You know, he's the guy that like, I am perfectly logical. I understand yeah. what's going on. And I think what it means for not a wartime consigliere is that uh, there's a lot of stuff that's going on. There's a lot of backdoor dealings and a lot of betrayals that'll start to happen really, really quick. And I think he's, I think just like for Don Vito, right? Don Vito knows how to navigate a war, but he's old. And he didn't get to teach Tom about that. Right. And I think what they, what they really mean is they just need someone more bloodthirsty. And I think it's also another way for Michael to sideline um, Tom 
and stick him over in, uh, in, Vegas. in Vegas because I think what he has against Tom is that Tom is is like a more reserved version of his father. And I think when his father goes, which he knows is going to happen, he loves his father. He wants his father around him as much as he can. But when that happens, he wants to build the empire for himself. He's very independent. And I think, I wonder if he thought that maybe Tom would drag him down. Yeah, that's interesting. That's an interesting thought. I think that that's probably true. I think there's definitely some of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know what? Yeah, actually, all right. The way, the way you um, opened up this question was, what is Tom's role in the movie? And I think I might even go further with that and say Tom Tom's role with the movie is for each one of the three dawns that we brought up for each third of the movie. Tom represents how they're treating the business and family, right? With um or sorry, maybe how they're treating everybody else. Um like Tom is a microcosm for that because he's of the family but a little bit separated from it. So with Vito Corleone, he's treated as a, another self with respect, but still made to serve Vito, um, which is what Vito, I think, is, expects from everybody. With Sonny, he just fights with them. He's always in a shouting max. And you never know what's going to happen between these two because, like, you know it's going to be explosive and maybe ultimately harmless from Sonny because you'll apologize from it and not much will come from it, but, like, it's going to be frustrating because... Sonny's not a very good Don. And then with Michael, he's just going to be shoved aside. Because it's Michael's turn to reign. Dude, building on that, I think he's their conscience. Oh, like he's cool. each of their consciences. With uh, with Vito, he's the sounding board. He's someone he's come to terms with and, and respected. And sometimes he won't follow. He won't follow what he does. And, he'll, it, and more than that, he'll define what the conscience believes is good. Ooh, with like with Sonny, he's constant war with his conscience, constant, just like he is with everything. Because Sonny's like a bad guy, but he's not he's not malicious, right? In a way that he, Michael he is, just he's, has no control. He's just hot. He's yeah. hot all the time. Yeah. So when it's love, it's it's love. When it's hate, it's hate. Like yeah, it's it, it's it burns quick. Yeah, and then it goes. And with Michael, he gets rid of it. Yeah, because I have no use for conscience. Yeah, yeah, no compass like that necessary. Too. Yeah. I also just think good business. <laughs> I also think he's us. He's us. Like you're Tom Hagen in this movie. I, I think that would be to call Tom Hagen the protagonist, <laughs> which I don't think he is. I don't think he is. But I, I think I think he's you within this family. Maybe he's not the protagonist of the movie, but mm. he's maybe the the, the closest door. To us. He's the yeah. door that. Oh my gosh, dude! He's the door that gets opened that allows you to see into this family's life, and when he leaves, the door gets closed in mm. a way. Um, so he's not the protagonist, but but it's 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 the the lens through which you see the movie because he's an almost outsider like who's chorus. a part of things. Yeah, almost. Ooh, the Greek chorus. What? <laughs> oh my gosh! Nice. I, I have nothing more to say about that. I'm just gonna leave it. Too. Like yeah. a Greek chorus. <laughs> I'm gonna throw out Brothers Karamazov thinking about that, and also uh, the, the Elena second... Ferrante series. There we go. I'm I think leave it's the those. second time that you've mentioned Brothers K. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's seminal. Done. There it Did is. Did it. Bing. Bingo. Ew. All right. <laughs> Any? Do we have more to say here? I mean, there's there's more so. to say, but I no. I, feel... I, I think it would it's incom it would be incomplete to say more. We've already hinted several times of things that happened in two and three. And I think yeah. it would be it would be a disservice to when we do Godfather two or three yeah. to rob those. Yeah. Anything else that we want to say here though about this movie without looking to those because this was made by itself, right? Or is the second is the second a part of the book? No, yeah, I think, or is I that think half of it is. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah, imagine, so, imagine that. Like, so, uh, well, I, I guess we'll say it now. So the first half where it's Vito Corleone coming to power, that is part of the book. And then the gotcha. part where Michael is off doing stuff at casinos, the other half, the futuristic half, that is not part That's of That's on you. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. So the really good part. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I, I don't have anything else. I think yeah. I think we should move along. Um, uh, okay, challenge here. Um, sidebar. Sidebar! Oh, we boy. got a sidebar. In one sentence, can you tell me why has this remained so enduring? <laughs> <laughs> why has The Godfather remained of such prime importance in culture at large for 50 years? I Two believe in America. So deep, much good. 
<laughs> so we got we got I believe in America and so deep much good. Although that that could that could be a semicolon. <laughs> so deep colon. I'm gonna put a colon in there. So deep much good. What are you, E.E. E. Cummings? <laughs> wow. Okay. All right. No. Oh, oh, oh me. Yeah. Oh me. What me? Yeah. You. No. It couldn't be. <laughs> and this can't be a Faulkner sentence. We're not doing big sleep or anything. <laughs> that's fair. It makes sense to anyone that's had a father. Shit. That's what I would say. All right. End sidebar. That was deep. Thank you. I tried. That's, I think what makes the Godfather so like enduring for like all time, though, is like that. That's part of it. It does make sense to anybody who has a father or has had a father. It also makes sense to anybody who has ambition, to anybody who loves family, to anybody who who just wants to start something on their own, to anybody who's ever felt like they're questioning whether or not the path that they're going down is going to be is the right one or is going to take them to the place where they first said they would never go. And those are, those are, those are things that stay with humanity for the rest of that, that questions humanity itself, at least, at least for me. Yeah. 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 Very nice. That dynastic sort of the passing along of the dynasty, I guess. And like the father, being like, I don't want this for my son. I mean, I think about things uh, in, in my own character that I hope my children don't have or in my own past that I hope my children don't do and hoping to guide them away from it. And then maybe the inevitability of of reliving to a degree uh, what what you've gone through as a parent, the desire to not do what your parents do, but then the inevitability of becoming like them, but different as well. It's, yeah. Man. So we, we usually end these by saying, is this a dad movie? And what I want to ask instead this time is on a scale of one to Godfather, how dad is this movie? Godfather. Godfather. I mean, th- th- you didn't even leave wiggle room. <laughs> <laughs> there is no wiggle room. No, this is this is this is Godfather. This is Godfather pinnacle, from all three of the us. The capstone. Yes. The, the ca- ultimate. The capstone and the foundation, bizarrely yeah. enough. <laughs> Alpha and Omega? <laughs> yeah, exactly. We sometimes uh, talk uh, about our, our Hall of Fame dad movie wall, and this is at the very top with like all the spotlights on it saying, this is the dad movie. This it's is like a the- family tree, and this is like the soul start. Like it doesn't yeah. have a spouse. It's just <laughs> everything was generated from Soul here. generation. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I think um, we'll, we're, we're going to have to do some internal discussion on when we're going to do Godfather Part 2. I hope it's soon, for my Let's sake. See. For my sake, because now I got this one fresh in the can. But for all of us at Not Your Father's Movies, uh, I'm Vito. I'm Mike. I'm Jesse. Happy Father's Day. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day. Day.